<clears throat> so Samantha, you're going to start? Yeah, yeah, start. Yeah, you can start. Yeah, Samantha, let him. Yes, sir. Please start, sir. Good morning, everybody. Today we are uh, having the elbow arthroscopy. Okay, today is the 25th uh, episode of Indian Arthroscopy webinar. Today we are going to have the uh, master class on elbow arthroscopy, and uh, really we are proud to have excellent faculty, both national and international. They are really they are big names in the elbow. Uh, so today I welcome our president, Dr. I. P. S. Oberai, and he is there. And also uh, I uh, welcome all my esteemed faculty. First is Dr. Naved is there, Dr. Kamle is there, Dr. David is there. Dr. Ram Chidambara, who is the, currently the president of Soldier and Elbow Society of India. And Dr. Ovijit is there. Ovijit is a very, very close, he's just like close friend and brother to me. He's an excellent surgeon, hand surgeon, upper limb. And also Dr. Richard is there. And another one, doc, again, Dr. David is going to speak on the elbow arthroplasty. So I welcome you all, heartiest welcome from India. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to, uh, to you. And please, I think we can go ahead with the first lecture. IPS, it is okay? Yeah, it seems good. I think let us start with the first lecture. First lecture and yeah. our first lecture is by Dr. Naved Ahmed. Uh, Naved is an excellent uh, upper limb arthroscopy surgeon uh, from Nagpur. And he's going to talk about setup, portals, and indications. So all yours, Naved. Yeah. Your screen. Uh -huh. So can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can. That's yes. good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, so good morning, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Dr. IPS, Dr. Samantha, Dr. Sandeep, Dr. Satish uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, the topic for today is elbow arthroscopy, and my talk is on indications, setup, and portals. So the indications for elbow arthroscopy are basically septic arthritis, synovectomy, loose body removals, uh, post-operative or post-traumatic stiff elbows where you need to do an adhesiolysis or a capsulectomy. Or when patients uh, who have tennis elbow are refracted to conservative treatment, you do tennis elbow releases. And in cases of osteochondritis, desiccans of the capitulum, I think we have a talk on this later. And some specific fractures of the, like the coronoid fracture or the radialite fractures, which are treated arthroscopically. And in cases of ligament injuries where patients have instability or patients with pain due to a plica. So all these are the indications. Uh, there are some absolute contraindications to elbow arthroscopy, uh, where the joint is distorted, either because of a malunion or a deformity, or uh, there is hydrotopic ossification around the elbow, or there is a previous history of a surgery where the ulnar nerve was transpositioned anteriorly. So all these make portal placements uh, very unsafe and risk the neurovascular structures. With regards to anesthesia, we prefer general anesthesia because it's, it provides a good muscle relaxation. Uh, and the patient is comfortable. But if there are some comorbidities, uh, then we do it under regional anesthesia. But uh, the problem with uh, regional anesthesia is that uh, we don't uh, get to access, assess the post-op neurological status immediately. And uh, I'm very, very, when, whenever I do elbow arthroscopy, I want uh, to know whether I've injured the nerve or not immediately. So that is one uh, bad thing about it. With regards to the uh, position, elbow arthroscopy can be uh, done in the supine position in prone and lateral. In the supine, you have a suspended uh, elbow or you can use it, use an arm holder. Uh, now the problem with uh, supine position is that the elbow is not very stable and uh, the access to the posterior compartment is a, a little difficult. Uh, in the prone position, you uh, have a very stable uh, elbow, but the airway axis uh, is compromised. So we uh, use a lateral decubitus solution, uh, wherein uh, we get the best of both worlds. So we have a good airway axis as well, and the elbow is also very stable. Uh, so we use, uh, the arm is placed over a padded support, and the elbow is placed at 90 degrees. Make sure that you have good medial access for your medial pelvis. And then you use traction about two to three kgs and you uh, use it to indicate. Uh, for traction, uh, so today is World Technology Day. So this is my innovation. It's just a simple skin traction kit, which I make the patient hold before the induction and then just tie it up with a crepe bandage. Uh, with regards to instrumentations, uh, uh, a standard 30 degree scope, which we use for shoulder or uh, knee arthroscopy is fine. Sometimes you need a 2.7 mm scope for adolescent patients and some tight spaces. 
it is advisable not to use a side vented inso cannula uh, because the joint is very small the capsule is very thin so the, you, it might be that the cannula tip may be intraarticular but the vents are extra capsular leading to fluid extravasation in soft tissues and then you can use your standard shavers radio frequency ablation devices the trocar which you use should be blunt tipped and conical that you don't uh, inadvertently scuff the cartilage you need to use a lure lock syringe for joint distension we'll talk about it in a bit you need mosquitoes wisinger rods retractors are uh, very exclusive to the elbow where you can use simple uh, curved uh, uh, dura retractors to retract the anterior tissues or you have uh, company made specific retractors as well and then you have to use your handheld instruments depending on the specific procedure that you are doing coming to portals there are a lot of nomenclature lot of portals uh, advised and there's a lot of overlap of names uh, for simplicity the elbow is divided into an anterior compartment and the posterior compartment in the anterior compartment you have portals on the lateral side and on the medial side in the posterior compartment you have portals on the posterior and the lateral side but not on the medial side because posterior medially you have your ulnar nerve so in the anterior compartment on the lateral side you have the proximal anterolateral portal the mid anterolateral portal and the anterolateral portal now one thing if you want to take away from uh, this talk is that on the lateral side the more proximal your portal is the it is safer because if you see the course of the radial nerve as it goes distally towards the radial head the portal becomes very very close so proximal is safer so the proximal anterolateral portal is made 1 to 2 cm proximal to the lateral epicondyle and just anterior to the intermuscular septum it allows visualization of the medial joint space the radio radio capitular joint and the lateral recess and the distance to the radial nerve is 13 mm now uh, because of its close proximity to the radial nerve the anterolateral portal is not used much uh, in fact we just use the mid anterolateral portal now and with this we can visualize the radial head the coronoid process the coronoid fossa and the trochlea on the medial side uh, you have the proximal anteromedial portal the mid anteromedial portal and the anteromedial portal so the proximal anteromedial portal is the first portal which i create of and it's about 2 cm proximal to the medial epicondyle and just anterior to the intermuscular septum and a point about these portals is that the more anterior you are the more safer you will be because you are away from the nerve but <clears throat> the more posterior or the more closer to the intermuscular septum you are uh, the more versatile is your portal in terms of vision and working space the anteromedial portal is 2 cm anterior and distal to the medial epicondyle it is used as an adjunct to the proximal anteromedial portal when instrumentation in medial recess is required and it allows visualization of lateral joint and proximal capsular insertion on the posterior side you have the direct posterior the posterior lateral the direct lateral and the distal ulnar i have never used the distal ulnar yet uh, so the direct lateral or the soft spot portal is made in a triangle formed by the olecranon process the lateral epicondyle and the radial head it is used for joint distension it allows for visualization of the radial head inferior aspects of the capitulum and the radio ulnar joint the direct posterior or also called the trans triceps or the posterior central portal is basically to the triceps tendon it is made at 3 cm proximal to the olecranon in the midline it allows for good visualization of the posterior elbow and the medial and lateral gutters it is good for removing olecranon osteophytes and posterior loose bodies now the posterior lateral portal is actually described as 3 cm uh, proximal to the olecranon and on the line along the lateral border of the triceps but i believe that you can change this and you can use it as an accessory posterior lateral portal and uh, you can uh, make that portal anywhere on that line and this permits visualization of the olecranon tip fossa and the posterior trochlea the complications of elbow arthroscopy as you might have understood the most important we need to think about is the injury to the nerves around the elbow these have happened in the best of hands uh, but the fortunate thing is that these are mostly transient and the ulnar nerve is the most commonly involved and then the others are the common uh, uh, complications which we see with other arthroscopies so just to avoid uh, these complications to the nerves there's something which are very exclusive to the elbow first is surface marking so you need to mark your landmarks every time you do an elbow arthroscopy you have to mark your lateral and medial epicondyles the radial head the radio capitular joint the olecranon the intermuscular septum on both sides the ulnar nerve and then you mark your direct lateral proximal anteromedial and the proximal anterolateral portal at least 
uh, like the hip, we also have to distend the elbow before we start our surgery. Why? Just you look at the uh, figure on the left, upside. Uh, if you put a scope in a non-distended elbow, you see your, your scope and your uh, instruments are abutting the capsule on one side. On the other side, it's the neuromuscular st structure, especially the radial nerve, which is just abutting the capsule. You see the kind of risk you are having there. But once you distend the elbow, the capsule pushes the uh, neurovascular structures away and it becomes less risky. So uh, I usually uh, use a, a 18 gauge uh, spinal needle and I put it in the lateral soft spot. And uh, then I use a lure lock uh, syringe with a three way and 10 centimeter extension. A normal elbow would take about 15 to 20 cc of fluid. A uh, stiff elbow uh, would take about uh, eight to 10 cc of fluid. And uh, uh, once you are done, you should get a nice uh, backflow. That is when you are sure that you have distended the joint. And then you create your portal immediately. A point about joint distension is that joint distension increases the distance between the bone and the capsule and not between the capsule and the neurovascular structures. So it is advisable not to use the shaver against the capsule. Use a punch instead. But if you have to use it, use it at a very mild suction level. And in the end, just a point on how to make your portals with respect to elbow arthroscopy. It's called a, a nick and spread technique, wherein you use the blade to just incise the skin, don't go deep. Then you can use a mosquito to spread the subcutaneous tissue. So this avoids injury to the subcutaneous and the deep nerves. And then you palpate the bone with your mosquito and then go along. So, and you aim distally towards the joint. A pop is felt when you negotiate the capsule and reach the joint. So the take home from uh, my talk should be that uh, knowledge of neurovascular structures is very important in elbow arthroscopy. You need to ask for a history of ulnar nerve transposition every time. And you need to position your patient properly so that you have access to both the compartments. And I don't use a pressure pump. And you should precisely locate all landmarks. You should mark them. And you should always insufflate the joint and the first portal which usually is created is the proximal anteromedial portal. They use an 18 number spinal needle for others and use the nick and sprit technique for making your portals. Thank you. Thank you, Navid, for the uh, start of the ball rolling. Now, IPS, we'll take yeah, any questions on There are two, that, questions, two questions coming for you, Navid. Yeah. Yes, sir. Number one, you said you don't use a pump, but is anybody in the faculty who's using pump? And if at all, at what pressures would you use it? I so think all... you are not using the pump. Yeah. This, that's the question. So nobody is using pump? No, I do, so I do use, use the pump. Uh, I use the pump around the 50, yeah. uh, 50, mm, uh, 50 milligram pressure. So Ram, you said free 50 milligram. With the flow rate? outside. With okay. the I also use a I I also use a pump. You should not let yeah. the fluid to be uh, accumulating in the elbow. That makes surgery difficult. So you have an outlet that you have a free running outlet. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I also use a pump, um, especially if okay. hopefully my Great. hopefully my video will work. You can see that uh, when I release the anterior capsule, the, the the space collapses, and I try to maintain that space. But I do that last, so I don't get too much distension of fluid. But um, I agree that for the most for most of the procedure you don't need a pump, but when uh, the space when the you start losing the capsule, that's when I, I need it at the very end of a of a contracture release. Okay, Navid, Navid, can you answer your screen? And the other question to you, Navid, is in a stiff elbow, do you manipulate it gently before doing arthroscopy, or you just would go ahead and do an arthroscopy? No, I would just go ahead and do an arthroscopy. Don't manipulate. I think it is just like the shoulder because uh, if you manipulate is going to bleed and there is a problem. Right. Yes, David? Yeah, yeah, true, sir, true. And it's very uncontrolled. But when you're going to do an arthroscopy, it's a very controlled procedure. Why do you need to do a manipulation initially? I, I think uh, the soft tissues are just too contracted to really get uh, any meaningful manipulation. But at the end of a release, then I will do a little bit of a stretch and then I will try to splint it in that position for a few days. Yeah, I, I agree with David. The tissues are so contracted, there's very little value in trying to do a manipulation before the arthroscopy. Uh, the last question here before we go to the next presentation is, do you give some kind of nerve blocks also for pain relief after an elbow arthroscopy, like uh, shoulder surgeons would often do a scalene block for it? 
no, sir. I mean, if there is, it's, if the, I think the question is pertaining to a stiff elbow release and after that for the physiotherapy, you might need pain relief. Uh, but uh, I would rather give a fentanyl patch uh, rather than giving a block. When you do adequate uh, release and then they have a good pain-free movement, they can go straight uh, mobilization of elbow. But if you're doing this for a very stiff elbow, you want movement and you have pain, I normally recommend the uh, indolling brachial plexus catheter and then mobilize the elbow without pain. For okay. two days as well as in the, uh, keep the patient in the hospital. And Any other faculty who is giving some nerve blocks for pain relief after? Uh, I, I, I prefer no. blocks for anesthesia over general. Like to me, it's uh, safer and then patients don't wake up in pain. So anytime, if I'm not, I'm, I'm, I just do upper extremity. Uh, so if I'm doing something simple in the hand, I do local. If I'm doing something higher up in the arm, I do uh, um, a block almost always. Even if I'm doing a shoulder, I'll do an interscaling block before they get the general anesthesia because they need a lot less medicine and they're a lot more comfortable after surgery. But of course, it depends on your anesthesia team and how comfortable they are to do blocks and what their complication rate is. Mm -hmm. Abhijit, you take on point, Abhijit, please. Um, one quick note of caution, especially for those who are perhaps just beginning their uh, elbow arthroscopy, is to first verify the neuro, uh, the neural status. So it's a good idea to leave an indwelling catheter preoperatively, and then once you have verified that the patient is moving his fingers, neurological status is uh, good. I think then you can uh, infiltrate uh, the anesthesia for pain relief, but not before. So people who are at advanced stages of arthroscopy can perhaps do it under a block, but uh, maybe people who are just beginning, I think it's a good idea to do it under general anesthesia, verify the neurological status when the patient wakes up, and then give a block. Just, yeah. just my thought. Is there a low role of a local nerve block around elbows, like you do for some time rest or maybe hand? Is it just brachial block then? Richard, can you take on that? Richard, please. Richard, is it a scalene block or is it a local elbow block after surgery? I don't, I don't use any type of uh, neurological block uh, before or after elbow surgery. And David, you said the blocks. Yeah. Is it a scalene block? It's an uh, infraclavicular block that they use most commonly now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So that's okay. Okay, we can, can move I make back. a comment? Yeah, please, please. Please. Uh, can I ask um, how many people are not using any traction at all uh, during their elbow arthroscopy? Because I've stopped uh, using it and I don't find any particular issues with that. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. Don't, uh, I don't use the uh, traction. You just have a little bit higher up uh, position so that the arm is uh, free flexing. Oh, so hyperflexion is achieved with the lateral position or prone position. So the gravity aided movement and the joint in separation would be usually sufficient. Yeah. Abhijit, no traction for you? No traction for me either. Okay, great. Well, uh, and uh, I, I do my elbow arthroscopy supine, so I use the traction simply to help keep the arm up in the air. But I only use anywhere between three to five and uh, three to five pounds. I'm not using it to actually distract the joint. I'm just using it to hold the arm up in the air. Right. Okay, perfect. I think uh, so. That brings to the close of the first, and we might still keep on getting questions, Prasant, and we might Prasant, keep on asking as well. Dr. Prasant Kamle, I think he is ready with his talk. Yeah. He is going to talk on the tennis elbow release. Okay, Prasant, you can go ahead with slides yeah. here. Can you can you see yeah. my screen? Fine, fine, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you all the faculties and organizer for giving this opportunity. So I'm going to talk on. Uh, uh, arthroscopic lateral epicondylitis release. It's a video technique. Uh, so why arthroscopy? Because it has, as we all know that it has its own advantages that uh, we can uh, see joint directly. We can address the intraarticular pathology under vision and small incision faster rehab. So this is the one of the uh, gym trainer patient we had presented to us with lateral epicondylis and has taken uh, injection and all non uh, all non surgical treatment and an arthroscopy we found that there is a cartilage defect on radial head and that was the source of his pain so as it has advantages so it has disadvantages as well so it is technically demanding procedure a uh, little long uh, learning curve 
and you have to work in a little narrow space or small space compared to the knee and shoulder and close proximity of neurovascular structure as previous speaker i told there is a transient in most of the cases they have the transient neuroproxies so neurovascular damage is also possible there so this uh, I'm, I'm going to show a video technique uh, for uh, ecrb release so this is a patient middle age uh, homemaker by occupation suffering from or uh, uh, lateral epicondylitis since almost six, seven months, and she had undergone all uh, non surgical treatment. And uh, she is not able to do her activities of daily living. So that's her MRI. Uh, you can see clearly there is a lesion in the uh, common extensor origin. And uh, I, I use this uh, lateral position. The portals has been uh, talked by the previous speaker. So I, we need uh, two portals for this procedure. Uh, one is on lateral side. You can use anterolateral portal. That will be your uh, working portal. And this is small surface marking olecranon radial head. And you have soft spot there. You can, yes, as uh, rightly said by the Dr. Naved, you need to distend your joint before you start your procedure, which I've already done. Uh, so that will push your neurovascular structure entirely and will give you more space to work in safely. So this is your medial portal, lateral picondyle ulna nerve, and I'm into the anteromedial portal already. So those surface marking. And once these are two, your this is your viewing portal. Once you are inside the joint, uh, you uh, make a diagnostic round look for the any abnormality that is your radial head and uh, is there any other pathology like a synovial plica synovitis anything that you can take it out so capitulum radial head coronoid and trochlea this is from your ulnar side the anteromedial portal this is your coronoid moving flexion and extension so now to begin means to those who are doing the uh, beginner you can make a lateral portal just drive your trocar and sheet towards the lateral side or otherwise you can do it under vision just like what we do for the knee shoulder or wrist for that matter just put your needle and you can so uh, once you do that take out your lens out otherwise you'll damage so i'm driving in my shiver inside through the uh, lateral portal and once you are in, you can put your uh, lens back and uh, have a look inside. So once you, uh, your shaver is inside, you can put enter a capsule again uh, push, to push it entirely. And I, as, uh, I don't use the uh, suction or the pumps. It's all gravity dependent and outflow is also gravity dependent. So again, you can push enter capsule. You can increase your space to work in and uh, you can have more look. So start perforating your capsule on the lateral side, uh, just above the radial head. You have to stay above the radiocapillar equator that I'll be showing on the next coming slide. So once you are making your capsular perforation, you will start seeing your red uh, muscle fiber. But where you have to stop, that uh, I'll show you. Once you're seeing, so this is a little bit of anatomy, the origin of precuradialis, extens carpa radialis longus, and below that you have the ECRP. So it is lying uh, below, means once you are seeing ECRL outside, so ECRB is inside. So you stay uh, with this equator, okay? So once, once you have done your release capsular, once you start seeing that muscle, that's your ECRP. And you either, at this stage, you can do uh, RF probe and you can release your ECRB or you can just show off the ECRB tendon and you can complete your procedure. This is what you, uh, uh, the uh, muscles arrangement is inside the joint. Once uh, top is ECRL and then ECRB. This is your end of procedure. Once you're to braided, once you're seeing your red muscles, uh, the uh, ECRB tendon is completely torn. So this is what I use. I don't stitch the portals. I use the sterile steri strips uh, post-surgically. And this is the patient pain-free completely at uh, post-operative period. So look at those scar marks, very small, almost non-visible. 
that's the uh, advantage of your uh, doing the elbow thrust so post operatively uh, i keep them uh, on, on rehab or physiotherapy department takes so over i don't talk much about it so they go with the uh, in the phase wise manner phase 1 just reduce the inflammation and minimal adl phase 2 that lasts for 2 to 4 weeks with passive combined rm till the patient tolerance and the later those patient who are athlete or uh, those who need for more high functional demand should undergo this phase Otherwise, most of the patient, they do well with uh, phase two post-op only. So to conclude, uh, arthroscopy is, has its own advantage uh, and disadvantage as well. And it has a little longer learning curve than the open procedure. Stay within safe zone, stay within the equator. You are, uh, otherwise, you will damage the radial collateral. And uh, as the literature suggests that functional outcome uh, Comparing ECR release with arthroscopy in open procedure is almost equal. Some uh, open procedure have more uh, infection rate and overall, but overall it is more or less the same. And whenever, uh, if you find any difficulty in doing the arthroscopic procedure, don't hesitate to convert to the open procedure because there is nothing wrong with the open procedure as well. So what, if you're doing your arthroscopy once in a while, then don't pick the knife uh, pick the phone and call your colleague and send the patient to one who is doing it regularly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasant, for your excellent demonstration. I think, uh, IPS, if there, is there any question? Yeah, there are three questions for Prashant. Prashant, number one, right. the, how do you choose your patients? I mean, it was seven months, <laughs> the one index case which you showed. So, right. what, so would you give a steroid or a PRP injection before... If it fails, and then you choose, or is it on an MRI that you find something and you want it to be done? Correct. So I, I choose my patient. Uh, uh, the most the surgery for tennis elbow is, is not that common. Or the, all the patients they do well with uh, their non-surgical treatment. Uh, initial part, as I said, uh, it goes to the physiotherapy for initial for at least three two to three months. Then if they are not doing well and that was code is still increasing, then we inject the uh, PRP. Uh, and that is also again ultrasound guided. So it should uh, uh, the, uh, the reach to the uh, only disease part ECRB. Otherwise, like one of the literature suggests that uh, if you inject the 60% of the time your injection is out if you're giving it uh, blindly. So it has to be a very precise uh, under uh, your ultrasound guided control. So even after that patient is not uh, doing well, then I uh, take a call for a surgical intervention. Otherwise, most of the patient do well with the uh, modification and some uh, max uh, PR injection. And the other question is, uh, how yeah. often would you use a radio frequency while uh, doing an arthroscopy in uh... For such cases. So again, again, uh, as I said, uh, the ortho, uh, RF uh, probe can be used to uh, release your ECRB tendon, but I find it is equally work well for me. For just you deprive your ECRB tendon with the shaver, though it has its advantage. It's like a more precise control and that. But if you are beginner, like you can go here and there, as and the joint space is narrow, your flow is gravity dependent. So if you are not control your temperature probes, uh, you are going to cook your elbow. So to be extremely careful. Perfect. Uh, probes, yeah. uh, any of the faculty who can give and add something uh, on what uh, was wonderfully presented? Uh, anything extra which you guys would do? Maybe Ram and uh, Naved and Abhijit, yeah, you want to add something? Yeah, you just can unmute a, yourself. Yeah. yeah, just a quick note, actually. So um, whenever we have patients coming in for surgery for lateral epicondylitis, one of the most important things to do is to rule out posterior androsis nerve entrapment. And uh, if you find an element of uh, PI and entrapment, uh, we prefer to do an open, after an open procedure where we release the uh, radial tunnel as well. Um, the rest would usually qualify for an elbow arthroscopy and very rightly as pointed out by Dr. Prashant is that uh, you should, I think, have a pretty low threshold for converting um, an open, uh, an arthroscopy to an open procedure if at all you find any anomaly 
um, you may find uh, cartilage lesions or the uh, scopy doesn't proceed well. So just keep a low threshold when you're beginning with arthroscopy. And uh, PI and entrapment neuropathy is a very important differential diagnosis. And if you have to release the nerve, an open procedure is well worth it. Thank you. David, uh, would you need to add or uh, is there something different in your practice, uh, the way uh, it was demonstrated? Uh, well, first of all, I agree that um, it's important to differentiate um, involvement of the radial nerve. And I don't know if there's a difference in, in the nomenclature in the U.S., but we refer to postgenterosseous nerve syndrome as a, uh, a palsy of the postgenterosseous nerve. And we refer to just the pain at the radial tunnel as radial tunnel syndrome. And the way I differentiate that is when I give a patient a cortisone injection for the tennis elbow, if it alleviates the pain in both locations, then to me, they don't have a secondary radial tunnel syndrome. Whereas if they still have pain over the radial tunnel with alleviated pain from the shot at the lateral pecondyle, then to me, they do have both conditions. But um, I typically um, do not do uh, elbow arthroscopy for lateral epicondylitis for the surgical treatment because I find that I can uh, do it do the open procedure very quickly and repair the tendon. Whereas in the uh, otoscopic technique, it's a much bigger setup um, and you're not fixing the tendon back down. You're just releasing the tendon, much like a percutaneous release. So, um, you know, there's different philosophies and different patient groups and, and uh, there's no wrong or right. It's just, that's, that's my personal approach. I'd rather do, unless there's another reason to do an arthroscopy, like a loose body or something else, then I just, I will do it open. David, when you release it open, then, then you take out that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that fibrotic part again, you fix with the anchor rest of the tissue? Yeah, I, I, I uh, debride the undersurface of the tendon, not the entire tendon. I debride the undersurface disease tissue, and I split the tendon longitudinally off the bone, and I shave down the bone spur. I didn't notice if you shaved the bone spur arthroscopically, and I, I didn't think I saw that, but... Um, I do remove the bone spur. I'm not so sure what's important. I don't know if anybody really knows what's important. I think it's if you take away the diseased tissue and you take away the spur and you repair a healthy tendon, a healthy bone, that usually works pretty well. Yes, Ram, Ram, Ram. Uh, you I, agree. Uh, I agree with Ram, you want to say. The arthroscopic technique will just get you to clear the uh, infective tissue, uh, degenerative tissue, but the mini or open technique allows you to have a chance of healing of the tissue to the bone area, bony pad. You could just decorticate the bone and you could even sometimes suture longitudinal split or if it's necessary, you could put an anchor and repair it. But post-operatively, you have to, have to remember, it will take a long time to heal. And the patient have to go to uh, recuperate for at least two to three months before going to full function. Yeah, I, I usually don't like an anchor because I think you you're, can accidentally make it too tight. Yes. I, what I do is I split the tendon along its fibers and then I repair the tendon along its fibers over the bone. And I let, I, I actually move the patient pretty early. I, I kind of allow that tendon to find its new home on its own where, where it yes. belongs physiologically yes. as opposed to trying to put the tendon back to some place that wasn't supposed to be in the first place. I agree because the anchor, my anchor uh, does a point fixation. So it may not be symmetric. It will cause tightness. So avoid as, such, as much as possible. Right. And it's not the ligament you're attaching, it's the tendon. The tendon should have uh, different positions and different posi uh, different locations relative to that bony spot in, in different positions of flexion and extension. Richard, so, there is a question. There is a question that some people tell that the, if you just release the ECRB, just give a, uh, a transverse incision to release the tendon and take out that fibrotic part, some people believe on that. What is your take on that, Richard? I, I believe that most of us don't really know what the cause of pain is in this condition or exactly why it improves after we operate on it. Um, I do do that. I open the tendon in the same way as David described, longitudinally, and release it from the bone at the same time. I remove the gelatinous and abnormal material from the tendon substance and then just close it side to side without any um, reattachment to bone, so no anchor use. And uh, it seems to work. I mean, I honestly don't really know exactly why and a lot of different approaches to this same condition work out but um, I like <laughs> I like the idea of removing that abnormal material uh, under direct vision I think in tennis elbow the old Jones 
technique is like that clearing that anything anything you do like the hen it will it will be cured <laughs> right it's a little bit like that it's a jones idea same old robert jones idea that's it uh, uh, abhijit abhijit yeah one very quick point uh, open or arthroscopy i think tennis elbow is one condition where you should let the patient ask for the surgery and not send your surgery to the patient so please i think the most important message that should go out to the audience is this is one condition where you should have exhausted every single modality of non operative treatment and then once the patient asks for surgery that i've had enough the pain is too much you differentiate between a pure lateral epicondylitis and maybe associated with uh, pi and entrapment like uh, uh, david pointed out and then and only then you should embark on surgical treatment of these patients yes thank you abhijit uh, uh, there is a question uh, did you see any stiffness after an arthroscopic release in some of your cases no Prashant. no 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 absolutely no, no, no. abhijit i think instability is a very big problem i have seen uh, open uh, lateral epicondylitis surgeries land up with damage to the lucl and an instability resulting so that is something which you have to watch out for and uh, so what, it's another yeah. question which is there it says an open procedure for all those guys who do open to reach an ecrb you have to go through ecrl so does that not damage the ecrl no 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 you never you go don't need to actually no no you have yeah, to you just need to push it this out yeah yes yes you have to identify who is is ecrb you cannot touch the ecrl yeah so i think i think we are uh, so uh, on with the questions samantha no more questions yeah you yeah. can so i will request yeah, yeah. our friend from california david all yours now uh oh he is going right. to talk on the arthroscopic stiff elbow release this is work yeah yeah definitely it will work can you see my yeah. uh, yes it's it? coming yeah yeah it's coming oh fantastic okay fantastic. let's start the show Okay, I look good. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically, the uh, indications uh, for a contracted elbow. So a functional range of motion of the elbow is roughly thirty to one hundred thirty degrees. But the, really, from a practical point of view, the most important thing that the elbow does is it brings the hand to the mouth. So um, that's the most important goal, and that's the most important. Uh, that's the most common complaint that patients have really when it comes to stiffness of their elbow. Um, when it comes to the pain, the pain could be due to loose bodies or impinging osteophytes. So what are the uh, contraindications to doing an arthroscopic contracture release? Um, heterotopic ossification, that's bone in the soft tissues, an arthroscopic approach is not going to work for that. And um, is a previous ulnar nerve transposition a contraindication? Well, a lot of people would say it is. However, in my experience, if a patient's had a transposition, you can make a small incision, identify the nerve. This is obviously not a small incision in this picture, but, um, and then uh, put a penrose around it, and then you can work around it. And then you can even do a posterior uh, medial um, portal if you need to. So um, Dr. Ahmed's already spoken a lot about this, uh, different positioning, prone, lateral supine. I do mine in supine position. So as I mentioned already, I use about three to five pounds just to keep the arm elevated. And with enough weight on the arm, it will stay in a, in a straight position or in a flex position as I'm working. Um, I do use a pump, but a gravity is fine. Um, I use a pump mostly to uh, maintain the space in the anterior compartment when I'm doing a contracture release at the very end of, a, a, of the uh, procedure. Um, also, uh, Dr. Ahmed mentioned 4.0 knee scope or 2.7 scope. Um, we have a 2.9 long scope, which in my experience works well for both the uh, anterior and posterior. So we don't have to switch cameras. Um, same, same steps, uh, distending the joint, inflating uh, tourniquet if you're using a tourniquet. Um, so keeping the incision superficial, dissect down to, with the hemostat. Uh, you want to dilate the portal with the hemostat, and you want to avoid going in and out of the anterior portals. Also previously mentioned, distending the anterior joint with fluid in order to uh, make it easier to get the, uh, the uh, camera in there to get started. The portals, again, already mentioned. The only 
mention I want to make about portals is that a lot of people will talk about uh, one centimeter from here and two centimeters from there with their where the portals go. I think it's more important to know the anatomy and know the soft tissue structures you're trying to avoid. And with that knowledge, you can uh, make your portals because uh, if you're working on a 14-year-old uh, girl or a uh, large, heavy man, uh, the, the measurements are going to be different. Um, actually, one point I want to make here is that uh, there, I wrote here posteromedial um, portal, as I already mentioned, if the ulnar nerve is, sub, is uh, transposed and you have a penrose around the nerve and you know where it is, you can make a poster, posteromedial incision. I also um, have uh, written about a mid radial uh, portal, which goes halfway between the, the uh, soft spot portal and the anterior portal for, for work around the radial head. So contracture release, if you're trying to do a flexion contracture release, you're trying to improve extension. So to do that, you need to excise the osteophytes in the back part of the elbow, both off the olecranon and the olecranon fossa, and you need to release the anterior capsule. If you're doing an extension, extension contracture release, you're trying to improve flexion. So you need to excise the coronoid process, the coronoid fossa osteophytes. And if there are uh, radial fossa osteophytes, you need to release those as well. Otherwise the radial head will impinge on those. You need to release the entire capsule off the distal humerus posteriorly from medial column to lateral column. And you need to do a partial open excision of the, and excise the posterior aspect of the ulnar collateral ligament. So unfortunately, uh, doing a uh, extension contraction release is not purely arthroscopic. So I have a case here, a 33-year-old uh, male fi firefighter who uh, he had no injury, but had pain, stiffness, locking with 35 to 115 degrees of motion, but had full rotation. Here in his AP view, we, we get two different APs because when a patient can't extend their elbow, we get one perpendicular to the humerus and one perpendicular to the forearm to see across the joint better. And here you can clearly see in the lateral view, anteriorly there are, uh, is a big coronoid osteophyte as well as loose bodies anteriorly and a posterior uh, lecranon osteophyte. Here's a uh, uh, sagittal MRI where you can see the loose bodies and bone spurs. And here's the surgery. Um, let me see if I can get rid of the sound. Okay, so we're looking in the joint. So again, my arm is up in the air because I'm doing supine. So the radial head is up, that's the capitellum. We're looking from the, the medial side to the lateral side. You see the loose bodies. And um, I try, I come to the anterior joint at the very end. So I start in the anterior, anterior compartment and I come to the anterior compartment at the very end. I'll remove some really tiny loose bodies if they're easy to get out. But for the most part, um, this is an easier space to work in than the posterior space. So I just kind of get my portals established here, take out some of the easier loose bodies if they're coming out easily through the cannula like that. And then I move uh, posteriorly. Here's the posterior radial capitellar joint. So I'm looking radial head up above, capitellum below, the ulnar is to the left. And through this, you see this little piece of tissue in the joint and through this mid radial portal that I have established, midway between this portal and the anterior portal, um, I can do a lot of work on the radial side of the uh, elbow posterior laterally to clean out posterior capsular, uh, posterior, posterior lateral capsular tissue to debride the radial capitellar joint from posteriorly. Now I follow the uh, olecranon fossa down into the, um, into the, I'm sorry, into the fossa. I follow the olecranon into the fossa. The, the um, olecranon tip is to the upper left and we're looking into the fossa. The lateral column is to the right, the medial column is to the left. I make a mid triceps portal with my knife, one centimeter proximal to the tip of the olecranon and I go straight through the triceps and right up into the joint with my knife, that's my blade. And then I use a, uh, a uh, Kelly clamp, which is like a big mosquito to spread the portal. And it's also my favorite instrument for removing uh, loose bodies and other structures. So you can see th these are what I call future loose bodies. They're kind of sitting there like little eggs and nests and um, cleaning out the uh, debris, the uh, capsular, the uh, scar tissue in the, in the posterior capsule. Now to the upper left here again is the olecranon tip and it had that large osteophyte. So what I'm doing now is using a shaver to remove the capsular tissue from around the tip of the olecranon 
And from access here, we can, the, again, this shaver is coming through the mid triceps portal. If it's a smaller uh, electron on osteophyte, I can trim it with, uh, with a shaver or a burr. But this is a particularly large osteophyte. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the camera in where the shaver is and put the shaver where the camera is. And we're gonna look through the mid triceps portal, which is right now looking straight down onto the olecranon osteophyte moving into the olecranon fossa. And you can see how big that is. So there's different ways. Again, you can use a shaver to, to take this out, but uh, a nice safe way, seem, it seems aggressive, but a nice safe way of getting this out is as, actually to use an osteotome. So I'm just cleaning the uh, soft tissue off of the olecranon, and here's an osteotome. It's about a quarter inch. And you want to be able to take this osteophyte off without damaging the humeral articular surface below it. So this is a nice way of just knocking that piece off. And then that piece can be removed um, either directly or, pie or piecemeal. And you can get a nice, smooth, flat cut right across using that osteotome. One thing you want to be careful about when you bring these pieces out of the portal, you want to make sure you don't leave any pieces in the soft tissue like I do right here. <laughs> so you want to try to avoid that kind of thing from happening. Now, the port I switched the portals back again. So now we're looking at the olecranon fossa up above, and this is the capsule and uh, soft tissue off the back of the humerus. I'm using the same knife I used for my, my incision to release the capsule off of the back of the humerus. So we're looking at the mid humerus in the middle here. The, the lateral column is to the right, the medial column is to the left. The only thing we can injure here is the ulnar nerve medially. So it's very safe to take the knife and put that in there and, and, and cut that caps, get that capsule off of the humerus started with a knife. And then you can use this freer to uh, make sure it's completely free. You basically want to see muscle. You should just be seeing the triceps back there. And you want to try to take out the scar tissue. You don't want to just cut it and release it because that'll grow back pretty quickly. So you actually want to breed it out of there. It is still going to grow back anyway, but it gives you a, a bit of a start, a head start to uh, working on getting motion back before the new scar bands start forming. So in this patient, I'm doing both an flexion and an extension contracture release, not an aggressive flexion one. I didn't need to open them, but uh, this, I released the capsule here. And now I'm gonna go back in the front part of the joint anteriorly, remove those big uh, loose bodies. But sometimes they don't fit through the capsule. You can uh, try to shave them down or cut them down, or you can, I'm sorry, they don't fit through the portal. So you can, or you can bring them right up against the portal and then pull the entire uh, cannula out. I try to avoid going back in and out with uh, the instruments and anteriorly to avoid damage to the nerves. But as you start working, going back and forth with the portals, the, those, those portals kind of main stay open. This is the court. Now we were looking from the radial side to the ulnar side, and this is the coronoid uh, process that, uh, large osteophyte. So I'm going to shave that down. Again, you can use an osteotome. If you're going to use a shaver, you want to do this with a flexed elbow so that you're not shaving up against the distal humerus below and damaging that cartilage. And a good landmark to uh, go by is the radial head because this, this, uh, the coronary process should be flushed with the radial head. And sometimes another loose body will just pop up and surprise you. You can, you can use x-ray also to make sure you can remove the loose bodies, but it's, it's tough even with the x-ray sometimes. So the coronoid process is released. If there was a coronoid fossa osteophyte, I would have released that as well. Now we switch the portals again. So here's the capsule. And from condyle to condyle, I start in the center and I shave from the center of the joint back towards the condyle. So I've already done the uh, owner half and now I'm shaving the the uh, radial half of the capsule. You want to stay close to the humerus when you do this to stay away from anything important, any important structures. You want to see nothing but muscle or fat up there and that's it. So the, uh, here's a post-op x-ray. Um, the osteophytes removed, the loose body is removed. 
And after only two and a half months, he had a significantly better range of motion, 20 to 135. But patients will continue to improve over uh, even four to six months. They, uh, they're very swollen. They don't move very well at first. And uh, of course, they have to be motivated. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. Uh, uh, Ram wants to present back to back, so because they are identical topics, so we can have uh, combined questions together. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So Ram, you can share your screen, and then because uh, you talk about posterior impingement, and then there are questions which can be uh, yes. put to both of you guys together. Thank you. So just one of the comment which has come on on YouTube that uh, in a supine position, doing a posterior scopy is quite challenging. David, yeah. your take on that? David, David, oh, I'm take, sorry. I mean, uh, you, it, it's, a, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's a challenge actually too. So it's basically for you, you do it in supine. So doing a working on the posterior part of the humerus is... is yes, yeah, so I'm working up. I'm working up. But... Um, oh, you yeah, for the po for the posterior joint, I'm working up. But you know, it's it's what yeah. you're used to. I mean, when, when you're yeah. when you're um, if the patient's supine or lateral anteriorly, you're kind of I don't know. It's, uh, I I've, yeah, I'm I'm seeing this extremity <laughs> surgery. So I find that patient that uh, doctors who uh, are more knee doctors and and do uh, more sports medicine knee, they they like having the elbow sit there like a knee. And for me, I do a lot of wrist arthroscopy. Yeah. I'm used to having that orientation. Oh, yeah, I know. Ah, that's how you train yourself. Uh, so uh, let's have uh, Ram, who talks about posterior impingement. Uh, Ram is president of the Indian Shoulder and Elbow Society. Uh, yeah, Ram. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, IPS, Dr. Samantha, Satish, and uh, Sandeep for the kind invitation. A warm uh, welcome to, to uh, greetings from Shoulder and Elbow Society of India. So uh, my talk is about posterior impingement of elbow. Satish asked to talk about this particular topic. So what is posterior impingement of elbow? Is a pathologic impingement of the posterior medial tip of the olecranon process on the medial wall of the olecranon fossa. This is uncommon in general population, but common in overhead athletes. So let us see an uncommon uh, uh, case presentation. This is a 50-year-old man. Uh, Porter, uh, right-handed, he had a childhood injury to elbow, had stiff elbow, but recent increase in pain and clicking of the joint. That is a range of movement. If you see, he's got about 90 degrees of flexion, but the terminal extension is limited. So this is his uh, posterior uh, impeachment caused by the long-standing osteophyte. Maybe the recent history of fall could have caused some loose bodies and it's got uh, locking and terminal degrees of extension limited. This is the common man presentation of this posterior impeachment. But what we are going to talk about is the posterior impeachment happening in an overhead athlete. This is actually a spectrum of condition covered under valgus extension overload. Uh, these sports uh, is uh, like bas baseball pitchers, javelin throwers, and tennis players and squash players have reported to have this valgus extension overload because of repeated micro stress due to the uh, strain on the elbow. The repetitive micro trauma create excessive shear force on the medial half of the posterior compartment. This eventually leads to a lateral radio capitular compression that leads to a posterior extension overload. With time, you develop a soft tissue contracture, inflammatory inflammation, synovitis, osteophytes, etc. And then with gradually, the MCL gets attenuated. So valgus extension overload is uh, leading to all these changes. This is spectrum. It leads to cartilage injury of the olecranon fossa, especially on the medial compartment. Osteophytes in the posterior compartment eventually a breaking of cartilage and loose body formation could be found in the posterior as well as anterior compartment. And when the capitulum is involved, it will create osteochondral lesion. My next speaker is going to talk about that in detail. With time, the MCL gets attenuated and some uh, sports person have reported with cubital tunnel syndrome as well because the uh, osteophyte of the floor of the cubital tunnel can cause nerve compression. So you have to look for that in detail. So the presentation could be uh, insidious onset with a pain or extension of elbow, 
loss of terminal extension, and when there is loose body, the patient presents with a locking and joint effusion. Clinically, you have to look for posterior medial tenderness and the posterior impingement test. I will show with the patient uh, in a while. Crepitus because of uh, loose bodies, fixed flexion deformity. Typically, the patient presents, the athlete presents with terminal lack of extension. As you see, the stiffness elbow is a different category where we are trying to restore the range of movement of flexion extension arc of 100 degrees and day-to-day -day movement is from 30 to 130 degrees. A day-to-day -day life activities of daily living is enough. You don't need full extension. But for an overhead throwing athlete, full extension of elbow is paramount important. So that is why the FFD or the terminal lock locking of extension is important here. You have to test for MCL laxity test. In my practice, I rely on the other test described by Sean Botisco. X-ray findings, uh, if you see, there is a posterior osteophyte. Sometimes it can break as the loose body. And you also see there is a difference in the dominant, non-dominant hand of an overhead athlete because that is the olecranon fossa, osteophyte, sclerosis. You could see the loose body, or you could also see sometimes repeated uh, uh, stress on the MCL can lead to ossification. MRI can show a cartilage injury on the middle compartment as well as uh, capitular changes. The first line of treatment should be non-operative in terms of NSAID, rest, activity modification, stop sports for a while, steroid injection may be given, flexor pronator strengthening and range of movement exercise. But if the persistent symptoms are there or the terminal stiffness is a problem, if you can't go back to play sports, then we have to consider surgery. The uh, assessment criteria is MCL. If the MCL is normal, you could go for arthroscopic treatment of pathology. If the MCL is a problem, attenuation, you have to check, assess the stability, or a situation where there is an ulnar nerve deficit or a cubital tunnel syndrome, it often recommended to have open surgery to correct pathology. It's only 25 percent. I use this uh, stiff classification, stiffness types, influencing factors, uh, elegantly described by Greg Bain. Under this category, this comes as a soft tissue contracture only with articular pain and loose bones. Your option is either to do orthoscopic or open surgery to release. Orthoscopic option gives uh, advantages in terms of a minimally invasive pain relief, early return to function, etc. But most important thing is, if there is loose bodies, if there is an anterior compartment pathology, you could address that easily unless open procedure where your approach to the anterior compartment is limited. At orthoscopy, we do a posterior medial joint decompression with excision of the offending osteophyte and synovium, removal of all loose bodies, osteochondral drilling if any, any lesion is there. Uh, we have published literature supporting excellent outcome of uh, uh, arthroscopic treatment of posterior impingement in overhead athlete. This is an example of a paper. I will show a case in detail to illustrate this posterior impingement due to valgus extension overload syndrome. Uh, this 15-year-old right-handed national under-16 squash player was referred from Delhi by my good friend Dr. Raman Agarwal. He had had a small history of fall, but he continued to play, and he has been reporting with progressive pain and limited movement of the right elbow, and frequent locking, and he can't play. So he came with this range of movement, good flexion, and you have a terminal lock of extension. i just play that again. You see, that's the terminal lock of extension. And you have free, normal supination pronation. So this is my examination. Uh, this is the posterior impingement test. You hold the elbow steady and give a little bit of uh, jet key to the completion of extension. The patient will have excruciating pain on the back, only from the poser. And he, I could feel the loose bodies floating around from the front to back in him. So he has gone to the end stage of the uh, valgus extension overload because he kept on playing. So that is a CT scan, which shows the loose bodies and also the adaptive changes in the posterior compartment of the elbow. You could see anterior compartment has got two big loose bodies. The CT scan will show the size of the loose body smaller because there is a cartilaginous element all around it. So you have to view the uh, 2D slices to exactly look at what is the morphology of the posterior compartment and also the actual location of the loose bodies before. MRI is indicated to check, number one, osteochondral lesion of the capitulum, and number two, about the MCL. 
uh, and it, it will show the additional finding regarding synovitis, impingement, loose bodies, etc. So here the uh, capital M is normal and the MCL is normal clinically as well as radiologically. So we proceeded with arthroscopic uh, treatment. It showed the, uh, you had to scrutinize every film to check for osteochondritis uh, before. So I, in my practice, I use general anesthesia, no regional block for the operation, but it might be needed if the patient complains of pain afterwards. And I don't use any tourniquet. I use the prone position, arthroscopy, basic portals, accessory portals have been described. Uh, this is key, uh, the joint inflation to keep the, uh, the elbow flexed and move the uh, soft tissue away from the joint. Uh, as the classical uh, portals have been used, I use the on-demand portal for the lateral. And this is the posterior compartment you could swap this, the scope and the shaver or the bird. You can swap and then complete the posterior compartment. So at arthroscopy, you have to evaluate and treat all compartments. This is very important because it's a spectrum of a condition. This is not only posterior compartment. Removal of osteophyte in the olecranon fossa and the olecranon tip, synovectomy and removal of loose bodies. The loose body removal, at, uh, uh, David had shown elegantly, grasp it longitudinal, don't lose sight of it. Try to take it as a whole, because if you piecemeal, the piecemeal will float around everywhere. If needed, enlarge the portal to retrieve the large loose body. Let us see this uh, case scenario now. This is the uh, arthroscopy for him. You see a lot of synovitis in the anterior compartment. Uh, just uh, keep uh, clearing. Then you would see the bony landmark. So once you are clear, you would see the big loose body coming into picture. And it's about, about one centimeter in width. So keep sight of it. You could use a needle to pin it if it is really mobile. When you do the clearing the soft tissue, because the loose bodies uh, will be attached with some sort of soft tissue attachment, you had to clear it. So now next, you had to grab the loose body with a grabby grabber and rotate it to detach it from all its attachment. Now you decide whether you are able to retrieve it fully or part. If as far as possible, try to uh, take it as a whole. You could enlarge, you could hold the forceps and you could enlarge the portal and then uh, try to remove it. I have removed it as a whole here. So next is clearing the uh, soft tissue. And then you swap. You could see the radial head rotating nicely. Then you clear the anterior compartment, remove the synovium, and if there is some small floor osteophyte reaction of the trochlear fossa, you could uh, bury it as necessary and use the uh, radio frequency probe. If you use a radio frequency probe, make sure it is always pointing towards the bone, never to the soft tissue. And then I use the photos uh, outside in. So this is the uh, trochlear and cannula coming in, it's swapped. And now we look at the middle compartment anterior middle compartment. You see, as soon as you put the scope in, you see a big loose body that is lodged there. So now uh, go ahead and uh, take that loose body without losing sight of it. So it's a grabby grabber is used to grab it, release from the additions and taken again here as a whole. So that's being grabbed. And take. once you uh, take it out, clear the uh, synovium and the uh, soft tissue inflammation in the anterior compartment. So our anterior compartment is done. This is the advantage of doing it arthroscopically. Now you go to the posterior compartment. First, you would not have any vision because of the extensive uh, synovitis and the inflammation, uh, but keep on clearing with a shaver and the radio frequency probe. Clear the, it is safe to clear the polychronon fossa because there is nothing neurovascular structure in it. So once you do that, you would see the uh, joint and you could see the olecranon on tape, which is the inflammation that is an osteophytic reaction, which I'm clearing it. And the olecranon on floor is a bird to have good space. Then you look at both the gutters, the medial and lateral gutter. Clear the soft tissue on the medial lateral gutter. And you have to be able to see the front through that. And once I do that, I, I see this is the, uh, uh, we could see one small loose body in the gutter. So I just put extra accessory portal outside in 
to introduce the uh, instrument. And as you see, it's a small loose body stuck in that antipodal corner and it's out. So that's the third loose body. You have to remove it. And there is a soft tissue attachment. You just uh, release it, twist it around and take it out. So this third loose body is also removed. So once you do that, this is the three loose bodies uh, removed from him, his elbow. And post-operative, I put him in an extension slab and then start mobilizing from 24 hours post-operative. That is him post-operative starting to mobilize actively. And that is him at uh, uh, two months post-operative uh, achieving full extension of the elbow, which is pain-free. The patient has expressed his uh, uh, consent for uh, streaming this live on YouTube. So this is uh, him at uh, nine months post-operative. Uh, he's received the pain uh, squash and is now a uh, national under-19 rank two champion in India. So to summarize, a posterior impingement is a result of valgus extension overload in a young throwing athlete. In a selected patient's arthroscopic decompression gives excellent results. You have to look for MCL instability and all of those symptoms because these two uh, facts indicate that you need to do open procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Uh, okay. Thank you, Ram. Uh, uh, IPS? Yeah, so uh, one question to both of the speakers is the managing uh, uh, post-traumatic stiff elbow, how is it different from an arthritic elbow? So any tips? Yeah. See, the uh, arthritic elbow, we do not talk about the altered anatomy because the anatomy as such is normal, but you have osteophyte, loose body, scapular contracture, inflammatory synovium. So what uh, 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 David described is a osteocapsular arthroplasty, but the game changes when it is post-traumatic. Post-traumatic could have a distorted bony anatomy, you could have previous bollinated fracture, etc. And second, there may be some previous operation that could result in some changes. For example, the ulnar nerve could be affected. The ulnar nerve could be uh, operate, uh, could be transposed. So those things have to be taken into consideration. So if it is a significant, and also capsule, skin and the soft tissue contracture will be also more in the post-traumatic uh, stiffness. So not all post-traumatic stiffness are amenable for arthroscopic treatments. There are certain criteria where there is significant uh, stiffness where you need to do, uh, uh, sometimes you might need to do a limited a medial release as described to see the ulnar nerve and put the portals and also you might need to release the posterior band of the medial collateral ligament so that you have a good range of movement with arthroscopic surgery. But if there is any soft tissue contraction, uh, you, you are better off doing open or even in heterotopic ossification as an additional factor, go open. So the arthroscopic limited indication in uh, post-traumatic stiff Yes, David, David your, your thought on that, David? You want to add on anything on that? I'm just really curious why Ram had a picture of a baseball player, but not a cricket player. <laughs> it was it. <laughs> because baseball, probably he is talking on the posterior impingement <laughs> and valgus, valgus thing. Cricket baller. Yes, I think they could be as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was an excellent talk. Um, it's tricky in kids because uh, they're still growing too, so you have to be careful. But um, um, that was an excellent job and great result, and he's going to go on to be a champion. That's awesome. Thank you. So, David, the question was in art, uh, in a post-traumatic elbow rather than a stiff elbow uh, after arthritis. So, how do you change? I mean, Ram gave some tips about a post-traumatic elbow, uh, stiff elbow. Um. You know, if they have an, a, a good enough of a joint, even they're, they're arthritic, if they have a good enough of a joint promotion, even though there's loss of cartilage, they usually don't have too much pain. And I, I treat it just like a regular contracture release. Um, when they when they really are getting enough wear of the 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 um, with the bone on bone and the and it's non congruent and they start getting. Uh, um, even like catching where, where, where bone will start catching on other, uh, at the articular surface, then it, then it really becomes more like an arthritic elbow where you really have to start thinking about um, more aggressive open procedures like arthroplasty. Uh, is there a role of 
उसको सप्लीमेंटेशन आफ्टर आर्थ्रोस्कोपी इन एन आर्थ्रेटिक एल्बो सो डेविड फॉर यू यू नॉट इन माय केस सो आई डोंट थिंक एनीथिंग इज बीन शाउन टू आई डोंट थिंक एनीथिंग इज बीन शाउन टू टू डू टू हेल्प दैट एंड आई आई हैव नॉट um i i don't i don't use any supplement after surgery does anybody on the panel do that not not in my practice i think the after stiff elbow release you have to mobilize that is a key yes yeah. this supplementation is not at all indicated for the stiff elbow i think yes not at all yes abhijit yeah, you take on that yeah no i have a question for all the faculty here and uh, the question is how do you deal with the under nerve uh, once you're done an elbow release whether open or uh, arthroscopic especially and then if you find any ossification in the cubital tunnel uh, uh, region how do you deal with that how do you deal with the under nerve i think if there is a uh, if there is a issue with the under nerve we uh, concern i do a limited uh, incision on the medial side see the ulnar nerve release uh, uh, learn that from shown what is called he just go above and uh, proximally distally release it but no need to do any transposing unless the nerve is unstable with flexion extension so release the nerve protect the nerve make your and uh, superior medial anterior medial portal under vision and do a safe arthroscopic surgery but at end of the operation you don't need to do uh, transposition unless it is unstable from its location second thing when you do the medial uh, uh, when there is a stiffness which is more than 90 degrees stiff you might need to uh, release the posterior band of the mcl at the end of your surgery as well to get full extension so yeah i agree 100% uh, can i can i just make a point um, i'm sorry you're saying something david no, i i said i agree 100% so the take is that um in an arthritic elbow it is not like the cubital tunnel where the adipo uh, fascial tissue is still present and uh, the nerve can glide very well so your threshold for transposing would be uh, snapping of the nerve and which is good but i feel when you're done an arth- a release for an arthritic elbow or a stiff elbow <clears throat> respective of whether the nerve is snapping or not when the patient starts flexing his elbow with the, so the nerve has been at that position for quite some time and when further flexion is achievable the nerve uh, you know tends to get stretched more than uh, it should and i've seen a couple of cases in my early practice uh, develop some cloying and some ulnar nerve syndrome uh, symptoms almost always systematically do an anterior transposition of the ulnar nerve whenever we're de- dealing with uh, elbow stiffness yeah that's a that's a good point Yeah. Uh, Ram, Just, there's a uh, question. Yes. Uh, that uh, in cases uh, like uh, overlaid syndrome, which you showed, a uh, lo- couple of these cases also have an MCL laxity. So how do you deal with the MCL laxity? If we look at it, this uh, the MCL injury or laxity coming from uh, 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 is that is different as a part of valgus extension overload is not always significant. is around 15 to 20 percent have attenuated mcl but not unstable but if it is mm-hmm. unstable we have to do the classical docking procedure with the tendon graft and internal brace technique if it is unstable in those cases we have to be open as yes, uh, richard and david can you add to that i i think that um you need to either address stiffness or instability and it's you can't do both except in trauma yeah. Yes. So so um if 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 I if I do a contracture release and they're unstable I still want to move them right away and if I I can't really do a reconstruction of a ligament where I'm going to want that to be immobilized. So to me the 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 first goal is the motion and then if they get good motion because patients get stiff after surgery anyway. So if if they are able to get good motion and then they're going to have instability after that you know 6 months 9 months later then you can always fix the ligament but i've never seen that situation very bad uh, i agree yeah. I, i'd concur with that same same sentiment that it's it's really one thing or the other as as a rule and can i add just a point regarding the ulnar nerve again um in my experience of dealing with um, yeah richard uh, arthritic just re- regarding arthritic um elbow uh, contracture release and uh and work for that um if there are ulnar nerve problems i've tended to just do an in situ 
uh, decompression of the nerve um, through one of the through a posterior approach uh, without uh, almost never doing a transposition. Uh, and um, fortunately, in, in my practice, it seems to have been uh, adequate uh, for the situation. I, I, what I do is I, uh, you know, you mobilize the nerve to in order to release the posterior joint. But before you're done, before you close the wound, you put the elbow through motion through the, through the range of motion and you watch the nerve. And I think you had a pretty good idea if there's going to be a stretch on the nerve or not. And then you can make that decision. And I've done both. So. Yeah. Yeah, a small comment here. Yes. Uh, when, when, uh, when you're doing on postromedial, uh, working on postromedial side, that's the uh, like we we're initially talking about giving uh, block, brachial plux, block, or the general anesthesia. There, they are, these are the cases where I don't, uh, uh, I would uh, prefer to have the uh, general mm -hmm. anesthesia when you're working on postromedial, and I won't postoperatively give the block because, as we see in the literature, it is the alarm of injuries post uh, surgery, it is mostly while working, not while making your portal. So I want to make sure that I have not uh, damaged the ulna now in immediate post-op period. Yes, that I think Obhijit was stressing upon. Yeah. yeah. No, so I think, is, there, is there any question left? I guess you have to unmute. Yeah, last question. Uh, is there a role of CPM after a uh, stiff elbow release? Like for knee, there is a role of CPM. So any of the takers in the faculty, do anybody use an upper limb CPM for a stiff elbow? Ram. In, in my practice, no. I have used the CPM in England, uh, but uh, here I don't use it. Uh, and uh, I didn't see any particular advantage of using it either because the, the patient had autoscopic release, or even both in the shoulder as well as in the elbow. I let them mobilize from 24 hours. The sec day two, I start them mobilize, assisted movement and um, teach them and also passing movements. So they can do on their own. And I have not used it yet. Perfect. But yeah, the faculty I've started out um, using uh, CPM a little bit early on, but have not used it at all uh, yeah. of recent times. And uh, just to another small uh, comment to add regarding all of this, whether arthroscopic or open surgery, one thing that has made a big impact in my practice is immobilizing the patient immediately after the surgery for the first yes. night in full extension with a compression bandage and perhaps a plaster cast. An elevation and um, and that's helped immensely to prevent uh, collection and hematoma and assisted in in great in return of range of motion. Uh, absolutely, I think uh, the the hematoma and keeping the elbow flexion is not good for elbow. No, not at all. Yeah. So there is, there is a question: Some of our surgeons, after a stiff elbow release, would keep an elbow in full extension for maybe two weeks or so. Uh, uh, they say that gaining flexion is easier no, than gaining extension. No, no. So do you agree? No, not for that length. Of time. I, I disagree on that because you you should not keep the elbow in uh, uh, after you do a surgery. You cannot keep it in extension for two weeks. Then it will be very difficult to restore the flexion. The maximum. So is it maybe two three days? No, twenty four to forty eight hours maximum. Four days. I yeah, practice. I do four days. <laughs> Sorry. An extension slab. I do four days. Yes, David is keeping for four days. Four days. Four days. Uh, Richard, yeah. how many days are you one extension? Richard? Yeah, one, one to two days, usually just 24 hours. Yes, okay. Uh, it I, I, would do the, I would do the same, but I don't see him back that quickly. Yeah. Yes, Nawad, Nawad, you're taking something. Nawad, Nawad was waiting for something. Nawad, yeah. Yes. I had a question for uh, Dr. Ram, sir. Uh, yes. Regarding your patient of the posterior impingement, now this guy is young. You said he's 15, 16. Yes. So he has played squash for the last five, six years and developed. Yes, three years. Yes. Yeah. So he's now going to again play. Yes. He's again, will he be again prone to this kind of situation? And second, could we have done something intra-op to prevent this happening again? Uh, first thing first, I, I'm not aware of anything you do extra intraoperative now as far as this, his presentation is concerned because he had a stiffness, he had a LGS extension overload, loose bodies. We have addressed all the problems. Now, whether he would get it again, yes, I have explained to him that he might get it again because he's going back to the same sport at a high uh, ranking professional. Um, but we have removed whatever damage has accumulated in the elbow. That's what we could uh, uh, guarantee him, nothing else more. Yes, uh, Richard, David? I, I really agree. And I wanted to add, I, I completely agree with Richard regarding CPM. I mean, when I started my practice 26 years ago, I was 
trying CPM machines. They're just too cumbersome. They don't work well. I mean, if you, if you even have a patient in a hinge brace, you can see how they just, because the arm is a funnel and by gravity, they just, they don't have, never sit in the right spot and the CPM machine is just not going to work out well. So I, I agree with, uh, I even tried to, to design a CPM machine myself. It's just, I think it's impossible, honestly. <laughs> Yeah. It's a flawed concept. Yes, Abhijit, Abhijit. Uh, so uh, I had uh, the opportunity of treating a similar patient uh, that Ram showed, uh, but it was a javelin throw with the Indian uh, national team. And sure enough, after we treated him, he came back a few years down the line with uh, the same symptoms again. So I think any patient who is exposed to the valgus uh, hyperextension overload kind of an injury does risk, uh, you know, relapse of uh, symptoms. So you should warn these patients beforehand, I believe. Yes, completely. The same, thing, the same, thing, the same thing happens with when you do osteocapsular arthroplasty or OCA for osteoarthritis elbow. Uh, they do last for a few to many years. We cannot say that because the arthritis will continue, but we are making an atmosphere, uh, uh, environment for the elbow to function better, to reach day-to-day uh, -day, uh, movement rate, which is 30 to 130 degrees. So the osteoarthritis patients also, we have to explain that it is a temporary procedure. On that, on that note, Ram, and uh, to you and the rest of uh, all the co-faculty, uh, does anyone of you use any prophylaxis uh, for prevention of HO uh, after you've done these surgeries? In, in my practice, I do uh, give indomethacin for six weeks. The evidence is equivocal, but in my practice, we give. And no other uh, measures. Anyone David, else, please? David, David. Um, after removing heterotopic bone, I actually radiate the patient for one, one, one radiation session. Um, don't ask me how many rads. I don't remember because I don't <laughs> do that much, but... But, um, and I found that to work great, actually. I haven't had any recurrences, um, but I don't, I don't use it in uh, prophylactic indomethacin. Richard, your take on that? Any prophylaxis I, I, for you? I've, I've used irradiation perhaps two or three times ever and uh, routinely use three weeks of uh, anti-inflammatory after most elbow surgery. Anti-inflammatory means indomethacin? What are your choice? Uh, intermethacin is tr traditionally the one quoted, and I'm not really sure that there's much evidence to show it's better yeah. than any other. So I, I tend to uh, allow any different types, but if I'm think, prescribing myself, it'll think, be Mobic or Intermethacin. I think the most important key is mobilizing the elbow. Yeah. Yeah. If you mobilize from day one, I think these things uh, are, not, are only contributory. Yeah. Okay. So IPS, can we go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, any any role of night splints? No. Any role of night splints after release? No. And last one. Not, not in stiffness how surgery. How about internal really. bracing for attenuated? Okay. How about uh, internal bracing for attenuation of MCL in chronic injuries? For that arm? he has already told. That he has already told. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. okay. That's. Okay. I think we can go ahead with Obhijit's lecture. Obhijit. Is Ram speaking back yeah. to back or uh, are you done, Ram? Already? Oh, sorry. Did I not share it? I unshared it already, right? You did. Yeah, yeah. So now we we'll, now we'll listen to Abhijit. He is an excellent surgeon and excellent speaker. So I am really waiting for him to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, I really want to uh, thank the IAS uh, leadership, Dr. IPS Oberoi, sir, Dr. Samantha, sir, Dr. Biraris, and Dr. Sonar for putting this... Uh, uh, effort up and you know every cloud has a silver lining and uh, these webinars have really helped us you know exchange thoughts and ideas learn from our overseas colleagues collaborate and connect and I was just wondering what if this lockdown would have been a few years ago when we didn't have all this technology so I think despite the lockdown we are you know really enjoying uh, learning and keeping our uh, swords sharpened I believe so this is for um, uh, David and Richard. This is where I'm from. Um, uh, Pune is uh, central and western India, about uh, 100 miles southeast of Mumbai. It's a beautiful city. Uh, it's called as the Oxford of the East. We have a lot of uh, educational institutes, nine universities. We have the largest student population in India. 
And uh, come June and July, we have these beautiful monsoons. And this is just about uh, 30, 40 miles outside of my city. And it just becomes so beautiful and verdant and very beautiful. And uh, I'm an avid rider, so we kind of go riding to different spots. We enjoy, this is an alligator sanctuary here. And uh, it's just a beautiful city. Uh, and it's also called the Silicon Valley, pretty much akin to Bangalore. And this is where I work, uh, Sancheti Institute, which is uh, an orthopedic specialty hospital and a very uh, busy center. So coming to the talk, I'll be speaking on uh, osteochondritis, desiccans, and loose bodies. Ram has addressed that in his speech, uh, but I'll just try to cover a little bit about it. So of all the indications that have been listed uh, very well uh, in the first talk, uh, I'm gonna focus on these two here. Uh, loose bodies and capital OCD. So osteochondritis desiccans of the uh, elbow was first described by Franz Koenig. And uh, this is uh, kind of an inflammatory response that results into the formation of intraarticular loose bodies. However, we now know that OCD lesions themselves do not contain any inflammatory cells, uh, but they do uh, you know, result in loose body formation. And there is a progressive separation of a discrete area of the articular cartilage from the underlying subchondral bone, and that results in the loose bodies. And we all know that this is more common in the knee, ankle, and then followed by the elbow. And in the elbow, the capital is the most common site, although it has been uh, sporadically reported in the radial head, the olecranon, uh, the olecranon fossa, and the trochlea as well. And uh, more often than not, we find these lesions in young athletes, especially pitchers in baseball games. So you'll see that most of these studies and uh, reports on OCD of the elbow have come out of Japan and perhaps the US. And then obviously we find a little bit of a gender uh, predominance in males and the dominant arm almost always is affected but it may be bilateral from anywhere between 5 to 20% of uh, these patients. And uh, usually these are not self-limiting uh, conditions, and uh, that is a result why, uh, there's a reason why we need to recognize and treat these patients appropriately and uh, early so as to prevent a long-term uh, disability. Usually people will present with uh, pain and uh, reduced range of motion of the elbow. Pain is usually insidious in onset. It is progressive and is relieved by rest. So these are the hallmarks of uh, an OCD presentation. Uh, it is usually localized over the lateral aspect of the elbow, but it may early on present as generalized elbow pain. And then we also need to elicit any mechanical symptoms such as popping, clicking, or catching. Uh, which may uh, indicate loose bodies of plica. Clinical examination usually reveals tenderness over the lateral and the anterior aspect of the elbow. There is loss of range of movement, usually extension uh, instead of flexion, and then there is joint effusion and crepitus that may be present. Um, and then there is this Baumgarten uh, radio capital compression test where on pronation and supination of the forearm with the elbow in extension, there is reproduction of the pain on the lateral aspect of the elbow, especially when you're applying a, uh, an axial compression. You need to uh, have a few differentials in mind, and the most common one that you would think of is something called as a Panner's disease, which is usually uh, an involvement of the entire capitalum in contrast to an OCD where you will see just a crater or an involvement of uh, a part of the capital. And uh, Panis disease is early on, that is between the age group of four to 10 years, and uh, is usually not associated with sports. And uh, this is a, usually a self-limiting condition as opposed to uh, an OCD. Um, imaging usually is in the form of plain x-rays, but we should bear in mind that approximately 50% of OCD lesions will not appear on plain x-rays. So you need to be very careful. Uh, we usually order an anterior posterior lateral and then an anterior posterior with the elbow in 45 degrees of flexion 
And then you usually see these translucent shadows in the capitalum of varying sizes, and that gives you a clue. CTs and MRIs are thought to be more sensitive to diagnosing these conditions, and you would see such craters and signal changes and this osteochondral flap, which is kind of trying to separate out from the rest of the capitalum. All of these are coupled with uh, your clinical examination and history would bring you to a diagnosis of OCD. And I usually tell my residents and fellows that uh, your investigation should not be a Eureka moment for you, but more often than not, it, they should corroborate your clinical findings and help you plan and prognosticate treatment. Classification, um, the Minami classification is based on the x-rays and he has classified them, them as grade one, two, and three in progressive uh, uh, worsening of the situation. Uh, however, there is also an Itsubo classification and the Clanton Delhi classification using CTs and MRIs. So this is out there in the literature for you to read. Uh, there is also an ICRS classification based on arthroscopic findings from grade one to grade four. So again, in, uh, in worsening uh, you know, kind of uh, involvement and grade four usually has loose bodies and an empty crater. Treatment, uh, the goals of treatment are usually uh, an attempt or trying to rehabilitate uh, the patient back to sports if he is a professional level sportsman, uh, pain reduction and prevention of osteoarthritis. Non-operative treatment does not have a great role in OCD, but nonetheless, in grade one lesions, you may try some pain uh, relief uh, medication, uh, modification of activities, and some braces to help uh, and see if the person improves. Uh, operative treatment is usually uh, indicated when there is an unstable lesion, the patient has failed non-surgical management, and there are frank loose bodies and uh, if the patient has mechanical symptoms. And the type of surgery usually depends on the size of the lesion, the location and the integrity of the fragment. And there are several options out there in the literature ranging from an arthroscopic debridement to abrasion, chondroplasty and microfracture, pretty much to uh, the management of uh, OCD and other uh, joints. Uh, fragment fixation has also been tried with varying uh, success. Uh, we had published uh, a paper on uh, osteochondral grafting uh, for uh, this condition where we get these peg grafts from the knee joint and we pack them in, uh, in the lesion and we had pretty good results. This was uh, way back in the time when we had not resorted to arthroscopic management and if the lesion was obviously a large one. Uh, arthroscopic treatment is usually the uh, order of the day, uh, usually for Minami grade one and two lesions. You can see this osteochondral lesion out here. And uh, what you would usually do is uh, you would do a synovectomy, uh, you would do a microfracture, and then you would, uh, you know, kind of even out the lesion. So this is the lesion. I'm trying to establish my anterolateral portal and uh, perform a synovectomy before we go and address the bone. So this is the uh, microfracture in, uh, in uh, progress. And once you have done that, you would uh, bring in your uh, shaver or a small burr to um, you know, smoothen out the edges and create uh, some kind of a bleeding subchondral bone for it to heal uh, at a later date. So that is the completion of the osteochondral uh, microfracture and uh, shaving off of the lesion. And usually these patients will go on to have good relief. This was a pretty recent study that came out of Japan, uh, published in this month itself. And they did a retrospective study of 23 elbows in baseball players. And uh, they looked at uh, the outcomes of an arthroscopic debridement with or without drilling. And they found that uh, pretty uh, uniformly they had good outcomes, except for pitchers. They found that uh, pitchers uh, usually do not return to pre-surgical um, you know, level of sport. So that's something that you need to keep in mind when you are dealing with uh, patients in your, if you have baseball players coming to you or throwing athletes. The other part is uh, loose bodies. Again, Ram has addressed that uh, from the technical point of view. 
uh, but these are common conditions that would result in loose bodies. Uh, I'm sure everyone would recognize synovial chondromatosis from this particular slide. Uh, and you find these uh, loose bodies all around you. It's a pretty nice picture to see all of them and uh, try to deliver them. It's like a game trying to catch these uh, individually. And uh, it's pretty fun for the residents and fellows as well. And uh, doing a synovectomy is extremely important. You need to advise your patients that uh, this may recur. And uh, it is not possible to remove uh, all of these uh, uh, you know, loose bodies and some of them may be present because usually post-operative x-rays will show a few loose bodies that may be present. Uh, it is extremely important to address the posterior medial and the posterior lateral gutter from your posterior uh, portal, do a thorough synovectomy posteriorly as well, and look at the uh, tracking of the olecranon as well and uh, uh, remove any uh, bodies that may be blocking the movement posteriorly. So a completely and a well done um, uh, kind of a uh, loose body removal. You can find all of these uh, loose bodies of varying size. And this is the post-operative X-ray. You can see that there are a few more uh, bodies, but usually not amenable to removal arthroscopically. And you should warn the patient about it uh, prior to doing the surgery. And uh, usually these patients have a pretty good outcome. Uh, Follow-up care, again, is standard, has been di discussed uh, quite a lot. Complications are rife in elbow arthroscopy, and uh, people who are beginning or embarking on a career in elbow arthroscopy should recognize this, should train adequately, and then take, uh, take up elbow arthroscopy. Uh, you should watch out for complications and prevent them to the best of your ability. Elbow arthroscopy has expanding horizons, uh, however, is associated with a steep learning curve but is uh, fun and a very nice procedure. Um, and it's important to have it in your armamentarium to deal with patients who deserve uh, or who merit an arthroscopic management for an elbow problem. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And any questions that you may have, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. <clears throat> thank you, Abhijit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Samantha, uh, any questions? So, because I'm... Checking the. Yeah. Richard, you want to add on anything on that? Yeah. Oh, uh, that, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, OCD certainly still remains a challenge and uh, remains a challenge in its, um, in its early presentation and how long to continue to restrict uh, young people from their sports for and and uh, the, the, the threshold for intervening, I think, still becomes a, a, difficult, um, a difficult decision mm -hmm. and uh, to know when, when it is really loose and when it's not. And um, I, I think some of them do heal and there is a natural history uh, of uh, improvement in, in some of these, especially the younger ones. Um, and so I try and be very conservative with the, the younger they are and slightly more interventional uh, the slightly, in, in the slightly older uh, children. Thank you. Maybe do you do you meet that frequently this uh, this uh, capitular this OCDs because this is a uh, is a rare thing. Yeah, I, mean, I, see I, see them, I see them occasionally. Um, they're not all that common, but um, I've not had great experience with trying to immobilize them. I think by the time they they uh, symptomatic enough to come in, the fragments are already uh, loose. I mean, you know, and get an MRI and see if it looks stable, and then you try to immobilize them, but I haven't had good success with that. Um, I did have the opportunity to, uh, I, I treated a lesion just uh, like that one where it's, it's debrided. The lesion I treated was uh, maybe twice as big. And um, the patient did great, but then about a year and a half later started to have a little bit of catching and I had the opportunity to go back in there. And it was very interesting, the whole, the hole just completely filled up with fibrocartilage. And there was just a little bit of a flap of the fibrocartilage I was catching and that was, was causing the symptoms. But it was nice to see that that lesion had just filled in with uh, basically scar that was congruent with the rest of the articular cartilage. Obviously patients, mm -hmm. they, they're not walking on their elbows. So they do a lot better with uh, these lesions in their elbows than they do in ankles or knees. I could concur with that. I've been back in in a couple and been uh, amazed to see how well the defect fills in with with fibrocartilage. And um, 
And I'm, I'm loath to try techniques to reattach uh, these loose um, fragments these days. They seem to do quite well without that. Yeah, okay. I used to try uh, absorbable pins uh, for really stable lesions, but they're, they're really tricky and, and uh, yeah. just putting the pin in often just causes the fragment to pop out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. or, or yeah. fracture or break in half. Yeah. Because sometimes right. even yeah. the bio pins, they can get into fracture because these are all been avascular and very thin flex. Yeah. Yeah. Avith, have you ever tried with your bio pins here? So I have used bio pins, but not for OCD because I feel the fragments are very small and friable. And uh, I don't think only, and the rotational stability is never afforded. So I think at max, you can get one pin in and uh, I, think, I don't think it's uh, sufficient. So I would, I usually am inclined to do a microfracture and debridement and let the crater fill up with fibrocartilage tissue rather than trying to fix the fragment. Okay, so if there is no yeah. question, we'll give, go ahead with uh, Richard's talk. Richard, you can share your screen. We'll go with the, okay. another one, excellent uh, topic on elbow to understand what is the instability around the elbow. This is really, we'll eager to hear from Richard. Richard, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. O'Broy and, um, and uh, Satish and the rest of the faculty for the kind invitation to, um, to have me present at, at this meeting. And uh, I'm from, uh, from Melbourne, uh, Australian shoulder and elbow surgeon. And, um, and uh, we're at the, the land of great, great rivalry in, uh, in cricket with, uh, with India. And, um, and we need to actually improve, don't we, at the moment, having had some, some disgrace at the hands of our, our captain and his ball tampering uh, strategies of recent time. So hopefully we can uh, we can get past that. Uh, this talk is going to be on elbow instability, but mainly uh, focusing on posterolateral instability. You may have seen this um, this footage from some time ago of a, uh, a weightlifter dislocating his elbow acutely um, as he's attempting to lift too much overhead, and as an example of an acute uh, dislocation episode. So these. Uh, Instability can thus be acute or, uh, or chronic and in acute episodes, um, there may or may not be a fracture and chronic instability patterns tend to fall into a more medially based um, instability problem or a posterolateral rotary instability syndrome. And it's actually this that the majority of this talk is going to focus on posterolateral rotary instability as it tends to be a tricky issue. Um, acute instability is uh, by and large ultimately presents with a posterior instability and um, it's relatively uncommon, but uh, when it does happen, it's mostly in young males and they're mostly sporting injuries. Um, the mechanism is usually a fall into the outstretched hand. And there's a hyperextension almost inevitably and a, a pinning of the, the arm and forearm at some point in proceedings. Um, this is a, um, a basketballer, uh, Casey Brather playing with uh, Melbourne United, uh, who lands briefly, you may be able to see this in the slow motion footage here as he comes down the, um, the forearm is braced and a hyperextension moment passes through the elbow. Immediate management is all fairly uh, self-evident in terms of reduction and following that neurovascular assessment. Um, it's not common to have any major uh, vascular issues but there is quite often some transient neurology. Investigation by way of x-ray initially must confirm a perfect concentric reduction after dislocation of the elbow. And if there's any fracture, any semblance of a fracture at all, a CT scan is required to identify that better. Definitive management after acute episode, if there is no fracture or an insignificant fracture and a perfect concentric reduction, then early mobilization is important. So I don't believe there's any place for even temporary immobilization after elbow dislocation in the absence of a fracture. Um, I mentioned before use of anti-inflammatories and um, some early swelling control with ice and compression garments. Usually a hinged brace thereafter for around six weeks, just with a, a minimal extension block of 20 degrees for the first couple of weeks. And with weekly x-ray and follow-up, it's key to ensure that there isn't any development of instability early on with uh, lateral views in extension as we uh, supervise the recovery. If there is a fracture, it's not going to be the subject of this talk, but it's a, a more difficult issue. And of course, the terrible triad of a dislocation, coronoid fracture and radial head fracture is a very, very difficult um, uh, condition to treat and often comes back and bites us if it's not treated correctly in the first instance. 
quite often ultimately fracture fixation and acute ligament reattachment is required in these situations. And the goal is to achieve adequate stability on table to allow early mobilization. So one needs to do whatever's required intraoperatively to allow stable full range of motion on table. There should be no reason to um, turn to an articulated external fixator uh, these days in the early management of these injuries. And uh, maybe an X fix only for chronic or revision settings and I'm, I'm almost never using these nowadays. So when to do an MRI after an initial dislocation if one's concerned, perhaps in a young sports person or someone engaging in regular heavy physical work, if there's imperfect reduction or if the elbow is visually or clinically unstable in extension on follow-up x-ray or evaluation. So there's a place occasionally for early surgery in elbow dislocation when there's no fracture. In these injury patterns tend to center either as a medially based or laterally based injury pattern. And then considering either a medial or lateral acute ligament repair in these high, high demand individuals. If in doubt, then an evaluation under anesthetic can proceed to either bracing or ligament repair on table if adequate stability is not obtained. It's interesting that if both collaterals are torn and it's not based medially or laterally, we're um, actually more inclined to go for a non-operative approach in this slightly more balanced elbow. So there's more to say about acute um, management, but I guess the, the point um, I want to make is, uh, is something around posterolateral rotary instability, which is a posterior subluxation of the radial head on the, the capitellum, which essentially is an external rotation of the ulna on the humerus. And posterolateral rotary instability is usually the consequence of prior dislocation, and uh, it's due to a persistent injury to the lateral ligament complex. So there is loss of the posterolateral buttress for the radial head through disruption of the lateral ligament complex, which is usually evulsed from the humeral side. Um, it may be visible in this uh, intraoperative video here that the radial head on the, the left in supination and extension is subluxing posterior to the capitellum, which is in the right, more right-hand part of the incision. There's a rotational theory of, of dislocation of the, the elbow where upon um, necessary force, the lateral ligament complex of ulcers from the, the humerus, and there the, then the tear spreads across the, um, the anterior and posterior capsule. And often the complete dislocation occurs um, hinging around an intact MCL. And it is uh, in this, this pattern that we end up with uh, chronic lateral sided insufficiency. So a fall in the outstretched hand leads to the forearm being fixed in position. There's an internal rotation moment through the elbow via the humerus, which subsequently results in secondary external rotation of the forearm, posteriorly subluxing that radial head. So in these diagrams, this is demonstrated with a, with a spectrum of laxity here um, with uh, slight subluxation of the radial head um, to subluxation uh, of the uh, ulnar humeral articulation, and then on the right with full dislocation. These wrestlers, the, uh, the left hand there can be seen to be pinned on the ground as the subject is slung around and that twisting motion results in this particular injury. Here, uh, Andrew Bogart, an Australian uh, basketballer over in the US, comes down after a, uh, an attempt at the basket there and um, his forearm planted on the, on the, uh, on the ground uh, is momentarily pinned and the rest of the body falls comes around resulting in the injury. Uh, lastly here, it may be visible uh, in this particular uh, footage of another wrestler whose right forearm and hands on the ground. There's internal rotation and the humerus uh, and remaining elbow dislocate. So the etiology of postrolateral rotary instability is many times as we've seen following an elbow dislocation and subsequent failure of the LCL complex to heal. It can also be after follow a simple sprain of the elbow and there might be very little um, actual history given. It may not be as clear as having had a dislocation once before. It can be with a radial head fracture. We can see it yatrogenically as uh, Abjeet mentioned before after an overly zealous tennis, tennis elbow release disrupting the ligament complex or in situations of radial head surgery. 
There are chronic attritional examples with cubitus varus, long-term crutch walkers, and people sometimes with chronic lateral epicondylitis. So there's a spectrum of instability and most people present with, with clicking, catching and locking with use. And this is usually during the extension half of, of motion, the forearm and supination, such as getting out of a chair or pushing a heavy door open. Many people can then, if it's a little worse, feel a sensation of subluxation with a lot of, with a lot of movements and they can become apprehensive when doing work or sport. And occasionally people present with uh, recurrent posterior dislocation episodes, but that's not the primary mode of presentation, a bit like posterior instability of the shoulder, not presenting with recurrent dislocation episodes, but with other more frequent softer signs, this clicking, catching or locking with use. And basic examination is tricky because it's often unremarkable with a normal range of motion, it may not be tender and there may not be that much laxity to actual varus stress. So the pivot shift test is a useful one with extension valgus and axial load. You can see some dimpling of the skin and a clunk with reduction of the head. Um, this is uh, apprehension, and apprehension doing this test is considered positive. Perhaps it's better seen um, in the next couple of slides with this test being performed uh, as though the uh, arm were, were a knee with a person supine and the arm overhead with uh, both with compression, supination and valgus force in extension, trying to sublux that radial head posteriorly off the capitellum and then watching it click back into place upon flexion. In this particular uh, video, one can see that uh, in extension, the head is subluxed with the dimpling. And as we come into flexion, the radial head reduces into place with subsequent restoration of the contour and improvement of the dimpling seam. There are some other tests for this condition, such as the pushing out of a chair test with the arms and supination, pushing out of a chair from the armrests and a posterior draw. The lateral ligament complex, just to refresh the anatomy, is made up of a number of elements with the key ones being the radial collateral ligament, the annular ligament, and the lateral on the collateral, which is uh, the key thickening or the key component of the lateral complex, which helps to prevent that posterior subluxation of the radial head. It runs from the lateral epicondyle to the tubercle of the supernated crest. Here, a normal, uh, normal MRI appearance of the lateral on collateral is shown with the common extension origin superficial to that. In an injured one, this one shows a complete avulsion of the lateral collateral ligament complex from the humerus. And when this happens, sometimes one can see laxity of the, uh, the annular ligament with fluid between the annular ligament and radial head, which is not normally seen. In uh, this uh, uh, MRI view, also uh, occasionally posterior subluxation of the radial head with respect to the capitellum can be noted. And uh, quite often this um, results in a combination of injuries such as a dent or a fracture of the radial head and an indentation of the posterolateral uh, capitellum, which is uh, akin to the hilt sax lesion of the elbow. In this um, uh, radial head uh, CT, the radial head defect is shown there. At fluoroscopy, this is um, without stress of an elbow in uh, full extension and with supination and a slight and some axial load, one can see the uh, radial head subluxing posteriorly off the capital. There is some opening with bare stress. Management of this condition when symptoms are mild can be non-operative with bracing or taping and enabled uh, and continued with sport or work. However, uh, if they're symptomatic enough, then something generally needs to be done. Um, often the activities can't be avoided and this uh, is generally an unsatisfactory approach for chronic postural instability. So operative management, we need to distinguish between acute and chronic injury. In acute injury, um, direct repair of the LCL complex to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus can be performed. Um, MRI can show this injury. We talked about that as um, part of evaluation of an acute dislocation. And it may be indicated in some circumstances to go ahead with acute repair. Um, and uh, particularly in the, the pediatric athletic population, this can uh, be a problem with ongoing instability. So acute ligament repair is a relatively simple task of attachment of the origin, usually the injuries on the humeral side uh, with suture anchors to the appropriate part of the lateral epicondyle and incorporating the capsule and um, 
and wherever we can make out the lateral ulnar uh, collateral ligament. Um, it's not often a particularly discreet um, uh, ligament itself uh, and division. And a hinge brace for six weeks, once again, with uh, a slight extension block for the first two weeks. In chronic lateral instability, um, there are two approaches. One could be to repair the existing local tissue. And uh, this is a repair augmentation technique using prosthetic ligament uh, reinforcement or formal ligament reconstruction with a biological graft. And these could be hamstring uh, gracilis, for example, palmaris longus, or ray split the flexor carpi radialis. So repair augmentation uh, can be uh, described as the so-called internal brace uh, technique. And this is uh, to apply when symptoms are usually milder and adequate local tissue uh, is present, either determined on MRI or at the time of surgery. So the goal is to freshen up, maybe placate or reattach the disrupted connection at the humeral side to the lateral epicondyle and to supplement the repair with the prosthetic ligament, for example, fiber tape um, from Arthrex. As an example, this is a, um, a case of a 23-year-old uh, professional Australian rugby union player who had uh, a dislocation event followed by two years of left elbow pain um, when tackling. Plan X-ray here shows a little bit of uh, degenerate change and some loose bodies. MRI there shows a poor lateral ligament connection on the humeral side uh, where the asterisk is. At arthroscopy, uh, there were some loose bodies and some tidy up to do. And uh, various stress did show some uh, opening on that uh, lateral side. So um, he went on to have a uh, freshen up and re-repair of the uh, lateral ligament complex, which is diagrammatically shown here with, the, with a suture through the lateral complex there and supplemented by the fiber tape uh, to reinforce the repair. So this diagram shows the fiber tape internal brace over the capsule and the native LCL complex, which has been reattached on the humeral side. And this is held with a swivel lock anchor on both sides. Uh, this is his picture intraoperatively. This is through the cocker interval and um, the internal brace tape there can be seen um, spanning, the, uh, spanning the joint with the radial head behind the capsule there, uh, superior to where that internal brace is. Return to sport in these, these ones with the augmentation is around three to four months. So formal lateral ulnar collateral re reconstruction is more performed for chronic postrolateral radi rotary inst instability when there is insufficient local tissue, usually a higher degree of instability or are in situations of failed previous repair. So it's with an extra articular tendon graft. And um, the idea is to re recreate once again, the function of the LCL complex to prevent external rotation of the ulnar and posterior subluxation of the radial head and to resist various stress. Autologous graft is uh, often able to be, I think is preferred and able to be harvested. My preferred one is the Palmaris longus for this. It doesn't require a big graft. And um, a split FCR if they don't have a palmaris or um, a gracilis hamstring uh, is my next choice. Um, the setup, uh, these are done uh, supine um, with a, uh, a towel under the shoulder to deliver the uh, elbow better. Uh, once again, uh, an a, a extended cocker approach between the extensor carpi ulnaris and the, the ankyneus, extensor carpi radialis, sorry. And um, the center of um, axis of rotation, the isometric point of the graft on the humerus is the, the, the key issue. And uh, this was a good diagram I found um, showing that it generally is at the anterior part of the um, tip of the lateral epicondyle. This can be found with, uh, intra with intraoperative eye if necessary, um, but it's not often necessary. And especially if um, one uses this as a guide anatomically, if looking at this as a clock face, it's around the 330 position at the anterior and slightly antero inferior part of the tip of the lateral epicondyle. At the time of um, surgery, uh, two holes are made uh, on the ulna. Uh, this is at the tubercle of the supinator crest and then also one centimetre proximal and posterior to that. And prior to the graft, a suture can be placed through, um, held with an artery there. And the elbow can be ranged with um, that being temporarily held with the artery at the tip of the lateral epicondyle and a sense of where the isometric point can be gained as the elbow is ranged. 
Um, I use a docking technique, which is well described with um, both ends of the graft into the one humeral tunnel and the graft freely passing through the ulnar tunnel. Um, there are um, plenty of videos available from um, Arthrex uh, to show this type of uh, technique. Rehabilitation for this is the hinge brace for eight weeks, a little more protection of the arm and pronation if possible, and an extension block reducing from 45 to zero over four weeks and return to sport at four to five months. The results of this type of reconstructive surgery are generally reliable with some issues of fixed flexion and persistent pain are not usually too significant. Recurrent instability around 10 to 15%. Uh, Mayo has a series of these um, demonstrating around 80 to 90% satisfaction with results. And most, most people will return to their chosen sport with the, odd, with the odd exception. So in summary, with acute elbow dislocation, uh, do not immobilize it. Exclude a fracture. If there isn't, there's no reason to keep it still. Mostly treat with a brace or occasional early surgery in highly unstable ones, uh, perhaps higher demand instability uh, individuals. And posterolateral rotary instability, um, be aware of this as a clinical entity due to the uh, vague nature of its symptoms and uh, late presentation. Often need surgery and uh, reconstructive options include augmentation with an internal brace or graft reconstruction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for an excellent talk again. Yes, uh, Sandeep, is there a question? Abhijit, any question from your side? I think that was a fantastic talk. Uh, and uh, I just had a couple of questions uh, for Dr. Richard. And uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, prior to the time when we were using the suture tape uh, to augment the repair of the uh, internal brace, and especially with the hamstring tendon, which is a little bit bulky, you find that there is a little bit of a clunk or a you know kind of a snapping kind of uh, a sensation that patients get. Do you have that experience, uh, and what do you do to you know kind of uh, tide it over or advise the patient? Yeah, th that's right. Occasionally there is. Um, uh, I, I think that there's uh, there's not a great deal that can be done about it once it's there, unfortunately. Um, with more modern techniques, uh, it's not happening. Uh, it's not happening that often, um, and it's a trade-off. If the patient is um, is stable and functional, uh, that's fine as long as there isn't any pain, and usually that's not the case. And uh, I think Della, um, uh, sorry, Sanchez Sotelo had uh, demonstrated a very nice technique of you know like double reefing the extensor uh, fascia or the, you know, kind of the lateral aspect of the soft tissue in case where the ligament is attenuated and not completely torn. So is that a good way to deal with these uh, uh, instabilities or do you still go ahead and do a reconstruction and then do a double reef? No, I, I agree entirely that that's an excellent way of dealing with, with these instability cases as most of them have just a stretched, attenuated, um, slightly imperfect attachment of the lateral ligament complex. And they are the ones that benefit from that type of technique uh, you describe and the um, prosthetic ligament internal brace type augmentation of that uh, repair, um, rather than going towards a graft reconstruction. Yeah, absolutely right. And mostly the symptoms are well enough controlled uh, in this group of people, um, if um, if there is adequate tissue to do that, if it's if it's a hopeless thin, uh, useless bit of tissue, it, it can't be brought to the uh, origin, and if uh, the situation demands it, uh, then uh, certainly a, a graft is required. I would not use a tape or a, a prosthetic ligament um, in in isolation without any type of biological capsule or ligament or graft material there. Dr. Samantha, can I ask one more question, time permitting, please? No problem, yeah. Yeah, so uh, my question is in terms of rehab, Richard, and, uh, you know, we advise the patients not to, uh, you know, have any uh, virus uh, stresses uh, on the elbow with the shoulder and abduction. Uh, this was especially when we were doing these uh, tendon reconstructions. Now, with the advent of the internal brace, uh, how soon, if at all, do you start uh, movement in the frontal pay plane uh, when you're rehabilitating the patient as opposed to doing it just in the coronal plane? Yeah, I, te I tend to like to wait six weeks 
before that as best as possible. It's not often the most reliable group of people, the young, young sports people that we're dealing with. But I like to avoid those frontal activities for six weeks if possible, uh, just, just to prevent that strain and give it the best chance of tightening up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, I think, I think David, you are ready with your talk, David? Yeah. Okay, so Vijit and all, we are going ahead with, the, we, are, uh, we are really eager to listen to his ex expertise on the elbow arthroplasty. David, go ahead. Okay, you can see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd also like to thank everyone for inviting me to, uh, to be, participate in this uh, conference. I think it's great. And uh, thank the uh, Indian Arthroscopy Society. And also, uh, you know, having been there in January in Nagpur, and I saw a lot of you, so it's great to see uh, those familiar faces again. So uh, this has been great, and I really appreciate it. So um, this is uh, regarding uh, distal biceps repair. Uh, and it's essentially a technique that I came up with a um, little bit different than existing techniques. So uh, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, ruptures and current management. And um, it's uh, an uncommon tendon rupture, relatively speaking. It occurs most commonly in men from 30 to 50 years of age, uh, do typically dominant arm, though I have seen a fair number of uh, bilaterals, not at the same time, but a uh, patient will have one fixed and then uh, eventually rupture the other one somehow. Uh, not necessarily on steroids. Um, it's due to a forced eccentric extension of the elbow. Uh, cigarette smoking increases the risk. And the uh, etiology is not exactly understood, but it may be related to this vascular watershed zone or due to uh, tendon impingement and full pronation. So since we're on the theme of watching the bodybuilders, uh, you can watch this bodybuilder's left biceps when this uh, judge gets her arm out of the way. There it goes, popped. So um, when it comes to uh, considerations on what to, how to manage these conditions, uh, we take a lot of things into consideration, their occupation, arm dominance, the strength and endurance. Um, it says here a supination loss of uh, 30 to 40%, but in my experience, it's, it's more like uh, 70 to 80% uh, rather than uh, what has been in the literature. Elbow flexion, I agree, they lose about 20% of their flexion strength. And of course they have a, a Popeye deformity. So non-operative management, I always, always offer to patients and um, I'll tell you the ones who, uh, who um, want to take that path are the ones who are usually uh, surgical or medical profession, professionals who uh, they know that if they don't have surgery, they can pretty much start working right away. They're gonna have some permanent loss of supination and a little bit of deformity, but they're able to get back to um, all their activities very quickly. Um, However, the vast majority do want to have their muscle look normal again and, and are worried about their loss of strength and opt for uh, surgery. Surgery, uh, sur 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 uh, procedures that have been described include the brachialis tenodesis, of course, an anatomic repair, and then for chronic ruptures, uh, allograft. So the fixation techniques began with dual incisions, transosseous technique, and then with the advent of suture anchors, uh, single incision techniques, use of anchors, use of uh, cortical buttons, and interference screws. So the surgical outcomes historically have been very good, excellent. Um, they restore the normal um, function and strength, excellent outcome scores, low re-rupture rates, and uh, consistent with restoration of their uh, preoperative strength. Complications have been uh, repair failure, 
elbow and forearm stiffness either due to heterotopic ossification or synostosis, and then of course uh, cutaneous nerve injury, including the ones listed here, and even uh, fracture of the radius. So the um, technique I came up with um, it's basically similar to the uh, two anchor technique, except I didn't like having to use two anchors that were always so expensive. We work in, uh, in the US in surgery centers that we own and we don't get reimbursed necessarily for, the, uh, for these uh, anchors. And um, so I had an idea of using one instead of two, but still functioning just like, a, just like two gliding sutures from uh, two separate anchors. So I use this an endo button and a single endo button. And it's, uh, there's number two suture run through each of the outer holes. And drill holes are made in the bicipital tuberosity, the proximal radius, a large one proc uh, distally and a smaller one proximally. And then uh, you, uh, by passing uh, the suture, the number of ways that can be done to do this, but the suture is passed uh, into the bigger hole and then out the smaller hole. And um, it basically creates the equivalent of two independent anchors that have gliding sutures. The first one is sutured up and down the, I'm sorry, the proximal one is sutured up and down the medial aspect of the tendon. And then by pulling up on that, it pulls the tendon down to the hole and it pulls the anchor up towards the hole and that's tied. And then similarly with the other anchor, the sutures run up and down and then tied and that fixes the tendon down to the prepared bed. So uh, this longer mark is the, uh, just a landmark I use, it's the most distal flexion crease. And then I go two centimeters distal to that in the mid proximal form, transverse incision approximately four centimeters. So we were talking about anesthesia earlier. This is a patient who had a nerve block and nothing else. So I was able to pull down the drape and I put the clamp on his tendon and I put his finger on the clamp and he was able to, I showed him how he was moving his own biceps. Very entertaining. Here's the, uh, through the incision, you can see the two drill holes in the bone. The anchor is being passed into the larger hole pulling the sutures out through the smaller hole. And then you essentially have the two gliding sutures. So each suture is run up and down half of the tendon. And then by pulling up on one limb, it pulls the tendon down and that's tied upon itself. And then again, done with the second suture. And the closure. And then that's what the post-operative x-ray looks like, an intracortical endo button. So again, I, the rationale is I felt I wanted to have a decreased cost compared to two anchors. There's, uh, with open technique, decreased injury to the postcontraceous nerve, cosmetic single transverse skin incision, excellent fixation without uh, too much too much of a uh, violation of the cortex of the bone that can risk fracture. So we did a study, retro retrospective case series with over a year of follow-up. We did chart and imaging review and dash questionnaire and satisfaction survey. We looked at re-ruptures and complications And we had 68% of patients respond with a mean of an average of four years of post-op with the minimum post-op being 1.3 years. We had 81% extremely satisfied, 10% very satisfied, 81% with no limitations with any activity, 76% were completely pain-free with a mean dash of 3.5 and a sports dash of 2.5 with no re-ruptures. We had a couple of uh, 
nerve irritations of the uh, lateral interbrachiocutaneous nerve and radial sensory nerve. Uh, there were no postcontraceous nerve neuropraxias. I still had two heterotopic ossifications despite the fight of this, despite the spec, I'm sorry, despite the fact that it was a single incision, but no synostoses and no wound complications. So in discussion, 91% um, excellent or very satisfied compared to uh, other studies that have been done previously. DASH score of 3.5 was uh, great compared to previous studies as well. There were no re-ruptures. And, um, which showed, and there were no re-ruptures of clinical evidence of strong tendon to bone fixation. We had two patients with um, remaining uh, sensory nerve uh, deficit and um, one radial sensory nerve. I think that's mostly rela related to uh, just the retraction. So in conclusion, it's a strong tendon fixation, reliable biologic bone to tendon healing without significant bone tunnels decreased implant cost, excellent satisfaction rates, excellent restoration of the DASH scores, no re-ruptures, long-term improvement in forearm range of motion, uh, comparable cutaneous nerve injury compared to other studies, and decreased risk to the postcontraceous nerve. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, for an excellent talk. Uh, any question, Avijit, from your side? Um, no, I think that was a great talk, uh, David. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, had a couple of questions uh, related to this, uh, you know, talk on uh, endoscopic uh, repair of biceps tendon. Uh, I would like to know uh, your thoughts as well as Richard's on, uh, you know, the merits and. Uh, advantages or maybe pros and cons of an endoscopic repair um, as opposed to doing an open or a mini open repair? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I always encourage uh, advancements and um, smaller wounds when possible. But you can see my wound is pretty small and they heal beautifully. Um, sometimes when you do these procedures, You'll, there, there are no blood vessels in the way. And other times there's just an unbelievable leash and you just tie off vessels left and right till you can get down there. So um, I think, you know, it's, it is somewhat risky, riskier when you're uh, using, the, using uh, endoscopy. But um, I've not tried it myself, but um, I'm pretty happy with my technique. What about you, Richard? I am. Um... But yeah, no, one of my colleagues, Greg Bain, um, is big on promoting endoscopic uh, evaluation, uh, debridement of local inflammatory tissue and the bursa there, and managing those those annoying partial thickness lesions that cause pain that don't maybe require a surgical repair yet, and then moving on to um, endoscopically assisted in situ partial repairs um, of those of those partial lesions. Um, with an anchor fixation, and maybe there's a maybe there's a role for for endoscopic work in terms of assisting with a repair, an anchor-based repair of those partial um, of those partial injuries. But like you, I do all of these open, and um, and I don't I don't see the the point at the moment in in pushing on with an all arthroscopic all endoscopic um, retrieval of the of the tendon and and reattachment. I, I, I can't see how it's necessarily physically possible to achieve that as as well as as we can with with these end of button techniques and uh, maybe for evaluation for debridement and for in situ partial repairs as, as per Greg maybe it's not a bad idea. Um, can I say also um, I really like your technique that's uh, that's fantastic and uh, something I might uh, consider rather than, rather than breaching that far cortex with an end of button and putting the nerve at risk. Thank you. That was a great technique. Thanks, David. Thanks for thanks, Richard, for sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Can I um, can I mention another thing uh, regarding oh, yeah. this? And um, the the rate of injury, uh, uh, I like all of us dealing with this. 
see a lot of the palsy to the, anti, the, the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve. Um, but then I took to checking this prior to surgery and noted that in about a quarter of patients, there's a preoperative uh, lesion of that nerve. Uh, it gets caught up in the inflammatory mass in the scar tissue and the retraction of the tendon or whatever it is, quite a large proportion already have numbness there preoperatively, which I didn't think about until I took to checking it one day. So um, in, in, in light of workers' compensation issues or just for patients' peace of mind, it's good to know that it's there before the surgery sometimes. And that's, that's an interesting <laughs> observation. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I, yes, uh, I, think, I think we have covered the, from the portals, indications, and how we go ahead with the elbow arthroscopy. I think, um, uh, Navid, do you have any question to David, Avijit, or Richard, or Ranjit, or Prasant, anybody? Any question? Just we'll be closing then. No, sir, we are fine. Good. Excellent presentation. Okay, okay. Okay, Prasant, do you have any 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 anything to ask to our international no. faculty? No, no, it was excellent technique last. Uh, okay. Ranjit, Ranjit, do you have anything? No, no, all the talks okay. were very excellent and uh, very. Okay, really. So, really, David and uh, Richard, with special regards from the our Indian Arthroscopy Association, and really, we are grateful that you have given your time. So we are really uh, honored for that. And I, I also uh, special regards to my Indian faculty like Abhijit, Prasant, Ram, and Nava. They are all many, my close friends. So I think we will sign off from now. So oh, Bilaris. Tomorrow. Is all yes. Tomorrow yeah. program. So tomorrow we have very interesting program, advanced meniscus masterclass by none other than uh, Dr. Charlie Brown. And there are, we have very interesting faculties, Dr. Charlie Brown, Dr. IPS Oberoi, Dr. Shrikar Srivastava, Dr. Shreyesh Gajjar, Dr. Sakim Tapasvi. And uh, it will be moderated by our EC member, Dr. Ranjit Panigrahi. So please uh, tune in to the same place tomorrow at 6 p.m. onwards. <coughs> okay.